Any of the kids want to come up here and see how government works? You don't want to. He's, yeah. Come on up. That gives me. Yes, they do. This is how they learn. All right. Good evening. Where did I do with the gavel? Oh, you took it. Okay. All right. I don't really need it. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the February 26th Planning Commission meeting. I'm delighted to see everyone here this evening. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm sure my fellow commissioners are happy to be here as well. We appreciate the fact that you've taken time out of your busy schedules to come and visit with us this evening, because we like company. We have uh, three. Uh, item number two is public comments for items that are not currently on the, on the agenda. And <clears throat> Jennifer, I'm wondering if you'd like to come on up. And you can bring any of your friends with you there, if you like. Um, well, all of my friends are welcome to stand, including my two children, if they'd like. But um, just give your name for the for the record. Yep, my name is Jennifer Ostrick, and I am a resident of Oregon City. Um, I wasn't going to speak tonight, uh, but due to some relevant circumstances, I feel that it's more than appropriate to make sure that you guys hear my voice. I want to just take a moment for you to paint a picture, and I do apologize. I was actually going to get a printed photo, but you're going to have to use your imagination. I want you to drive down a street and see kids running across the street, so you have to slam on your brakes and make sure that you're not hitting any of those little kids running back and forth. You're going to see a couple of moms waving at you, possibly with a glass of wine in her hand or both of their hands. You're going to see a couple retired people working in their garden. Everybody on the block calls it the secret garden. It's pretty amazing. You hear kids giggling and screaming all day long. After school, on the bus, you hear all the kids racing home. And it's always been a really wonderful thing to see. I want you to fast forward a couple months I want you to turn down that same street. We'll say tonight, there will be no kids playing in the street. There will be no bicycles to avoid. There will be no parents chatting about how things were at work. And the retired people are definitely in before the sun goes down. This is the current state of Oregon City. Right now on Roosevelt Street, this evening as I was coming to this meeting, I know that there is a sex offender in one of the homes on the street. I know that this sex offender bragged to me and a few of our other residents that the girl he offended, under oath, he said she wanted it. This is what we have to come home to now. When our children get off the bus, they are not allowed to run ahead of us. They must stay with us at all times. Because I am a mom who works and I'm a single parent, my children must come in and stay. They are not allowed to go outside and play on the street. Oregon City is known for their sex offenders. Oregon City is known for their felonies. Oregon City is known for their halfway houses. I moved to Oregon City because I believed it was a family-friendly place. I fell in love with this little historic town. You people are here to do a job. You are to plan a beautiful and safe community. My expectation is that you uphold what you are here for. You keep this into a growing family neighborhood where people that are professionals and families can go and be safe. Allowing halfway houses that are unregulated, undocumented, unlicensed into our neighborhoods is unacceptable. And I won't stand for it. I won't be a citizen of Oregon City if this is the kind of behavior that is allowed. Thank you. Appreciate it. I have some, just for your information, I have some friends that just recently moved from Roosevelt Street, the Markowskis. And uh, so I was very familiar with the street. I dropped their daughter off. She and I were volunteers together. I dropped her off on a regular basis when we were working together. So I'm very, very personally familiar with the street. Unfortunately, since the Markowskis left, it's gotten worse. And if you haven't noticed, I actually personally emailed you to yes, explain went, our situation. I went down the street before I left on my trip. Yes. it's. It's concerning, and I need every single person here to acknowledge our plight. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you the next person? 
I, do, I wasn't listed to speak. Okay, well, please do. I, I, yeah, I would just... Just um, give us your name, and then you can fill out one of these later. Okay, sure. My name is Jennifer Lance, um, and I'm a resident of Oregon City. We're in the home directly behind the um, house. And my feeling is it's just really ridiculous that it, it, our introduction to these folks were... Um, a, calling her a, I'm not gonna repeat it, but calling her something really vulgar and insulting that probably most of us are aware of at this point, a FNBC. And so that was our introduction to these folks. That doesn't say to me these are folks that are serious about recovery. That says to me that these are angry people. <laughs> And it's insane that this has been allowed to go this far, in my opinion. I understand that there are codes and there's a process and they have rights and so forth, but what about our rights to be safe in our own homes? I don't understand how this is happening. I really don't. I mean, they tailgated her, <laughs> driving her kids to school. It's like, what more needs to happen, you know, before somebody fixes this for us? It's insane. We call the police and ask them, what can we do? You know, can you give us any information about these people? We're scared in our own homes. And it's like, you know, two folks have already left. I mean, it's it's heartbreaking. We've lived in our home for 13 years. It's like we put every penny into that house. And it was difficult for us to get into it. And it's disgusting that this is happening to these people. We are all hardworking, law-abiding people with children and disabilities. And it's like, I, I really can't, I'm disgusted that this is happening. Somebody needs to fix it now. Please, please, someone fix this for us. This town is falling apart. Thank you. Thank you. Matt and uh, Carla in law. Welcome back. Hey, thank you. Hi. Carla is Laws. Um, we agreed I would go first. My name is Martin Imhoff. I'm a resident of Roosevelt Street in Oregon City, just up the hill from here. And I addressed this forum two weeks ago to explain why I believed along with my fellow neighbors, that the planning office needed to be cautious, trusting information they might receive from the landlord of 523 Roosevelt Street and the organization he was renting his house to, the nonprofit Free on the Outside. <coughs> then last week at the city commission meeting, I explained those concerns in unpleasant detail. I put in all the F words, I spelled them out, um, that have been thrown at the neighbors and um, about this house that's intended to be a transition home for newly releasing inmates in our R6 single family dwelling neighborhood. So thank you for this opportunity to speak to you again today. I want to give you an update and also express gratitude. The update without the gory details. On Sunday, February 18th, the house manager who was installed by Free in the Outside who is a sex offender that um, Ms. Ostrick was speaking about. Um, he was installed there to run what was then planned to be a sobriety house for men. But on Sunday the 18th, he moved out and he told us the house was instead gonna become a sobriety house for women. Since then, there was no activity in the house for days other than the natural gas being shut off some interior lights seemed to be on a timer. From our perspective, no news was good news. As I was driving here, I got five, six texts. There were people who were showing up and moving in duffel bags, four men. One of them was seen putting, hanging a calendar up on the wall. Um, so there is new activity that we don't know about. Um, Shortly before I came here, one of our members who um, is very good with Facebook found a post on the Free on the Outside page about an intended cleaning party for this upcoming weekend, um, inviting people with an exclamation point. In the meantime, that's the update. 
In the meantime, we've received some feedback from the planning office, and that gets me to the gratitude part of this message. <coughs> I've been pleased my whole life to have no need to participate in the remarkable local democracy available to citizens, especially democracy that might involve some bureaucracy. Shame on me. But this month of February, encourages me to not fear this in the future and maybe even become a more involved citizen. Ms. Tarway is no small reason for my attitude change. On February 5th, when five of us walked into her office at 8.30 in the morning, right when the door cracked, she went out of her way to make sure we understood the parameters of her office with politeness and professionalism. <clears throat> Her personal involvement helped much with my wife submitting an appropriate request for investigation, time stamped at 11 in the morning that same day. I don't know why Ms. Turway didn't have subordinates handle our situation, such as the employee we first met when we walked in, but she used her discretion to step in. We left assured that a process would unfold according to ordinance and statute. The way she handled herself with us, with us that day and since has caused us on numerous occasions to say to other neighbors who are anxious or impatient, the process is working, the planning office is doing what they can according to law. During the course of the investigation, some of our neighbors began to send my wife information or thoughts asking they be forwarded. Each time, Ms. Turway acknowledged the receipt of the communication and responded courteously. Monday, February 19th, President's Day, couldn't have been a very good holiday for her. I saw her replying to emails well into the evening. I think 10, 10 11 p.m. was the latest one. Soon other neighbors among our group were corresponding with her directly. She always made time for them or had one of her staff respond to our questions or information with minimal delay. The story of what will happen at 523 Roosevelt isn't done. The planning office isn't even done with their work and then other events may unfold. But today, I want you all to know that the concerned neighbors of Roosevelt Street believe that an outstanding civil servant is working on our request. Carla, sorry for getting the name mixed up. Carla Laws. No problem. My name is Carla Laws, and I live on Roosevelt Street. Um, years back, we've moved into Oregon City approximately 11 years ago. My dad used to fish on the wall when I was a little girl, off for sturgeon fishing. Uh, my aunt used to live here. She's buried in the cemetery, so we used to come up here for years. Um, I always loved Oregon City because I've always loved the historic houses. My grandfather was an antique dealer. My great-great-grandparents crossed the Oregon Trail and ended in Oregon City before they went up to Walla Walla, Washington. So I have a lot of pride in the history of Oregon. So I wanted to live in Oregon City, and we bought initially a house on Division Street, and we always walked Roosevelt with our dog and said if there was any part that would bring us back to Barclay Hills, we would have to live on Roosevelt Street. And we had a house for sale and we bought it and we got a great deal on it and we're restoring the house to the original look of the home. And it was a birthing house for unwed mothers in the 1940s and 50s, I've been told. And I had a guy from 1947 say he was born in my house. So, we love our house, we plan on staying, we plan on restoring it. Um, my concern now is that Roosevelt's not gonna be the same on the street I walked before. Um, I have Chloe in the audience, she's almost 14. I have my son Samuel, who's almost, he just turned 11, today's his birthday. Yeah. And Libby's two. And, um, you know, I saw one of the guys working on the house walk through my alley, which my alley's kind of dark and kind of scary anyway. So anyone who walks the alley, I scope out. Um, and the other, you know, the problem I have is I'm hearing a comment on what one of the guys working on the house stated that a 10 year old initiated his reaction of sexual abuse. And I realize that whether you're a survivor of sobriety or trying to recover, 
whether you're a felon or even a pedophile that's been convicted, you need a home. I, that is true. But I, we had 19 children, seven with disabilities. My Libby is delayed gross motor, diagnosed. So she won't meet up to par of her age group at least till five if she outgrows what's going on. And my concern is I came here before coming to you. I am a survivor of sexual abuse by a pedophile. And I'm telling you is, I realize it's gonna be a women's sobriety house, but if a guy's managing the house that makes those type of comments and that will be facilitating the house in any way, obviously this group helps people transition. But my problem is if these people, whoever they are, come in and out of the home is, it's not gonna be the same Roosevelt that I picked. It's not gonna be, and I realize there's a transition and things happen, but I'm actually fearful for my kids' security, safety, and our freedoms. If an organization like this, where it's right on our tiny little street, one lane street, where even if there's 10 people there, where are they gonna park? Where are they gonna go? And I'm sorry, if you have sobriety issues, I lived on 514 Roosevelt. There are so many people walking to Plaid Pantry, and that's where they all congregate, you know, of all sorts of issues, whether they're clean, whether they're drunk, whether they're high, and you can hide pretty easily in our alleys. It's not, it's just, I am concerned about the security of my children. And I, for them as their mother, and as my family and my husband and the law's residents, we have to say no to this. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Laura, can you give us an update of where the city is on this particular issue? We're still working through a code enforcement um, request. So there is no update. Um, the city did receive so code enforcement uh, reviews are done in secret, right? Yes, yes. Um, we did receive the approval from uh, some of the parties to disclose information from an email regarding the use, and it basically said it was going to be changed to a women's facility. And that's all I can share. We're still working through it. May I ask a question? Sure, please. We're still at the beginning of the process, isn't that right? There's a long process to it. It depends. Okay. So, so the question is, is there a violation? If there is a violation, then there's a process to remedy the violation. And are they able to come and work on the house and move in even though the investigation's not done yet? I don't know if you can answer that, but. I'd prefer not to. Okay. We can, we, we, I'll, I'll chat with you offline. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I guess personally I'm not aware and I probably have to talk to our police about it, but I thought there was some regulation or rule that said that if there were children present, you couldn't really be within a certain boundary if they were um, sexual offenders, that they can't really move and, you know, be in a place where they're children. But I don't know, I, it's just something I w was aware of. I would have to check that with our police department. I, I, th I think part of the issue that we're having with this is that uh, in order for the Planning Commission to take any action on it, there has to be some sort of land use action that occurs or some permit that's filed for or something that we can respond to. Uh, up until that point, we don't really have any ability to do anything. She's fine. Okay. It's nice to have children in the audience. <laughs> so that's kind of where we're, we're kind of, our hands are tied with regard to this particular issue about whether we can make the move out. We, we don't have authority as a planning commission to do that. If they come in and request something, we have the ability to adjudicate it and make a decision regarding it. We had, um, some years ago, we had a request from an organization to move into uh, a neighborhood off of Warner Parrott Road and that had nothing, what they were doing had really nothing to do with it. It just, the zoning wasn't really right for what they wanted to do. And that's what we based our decision on. And uh, they, it did not appeal it, so they are no longer there, but uh, that's the only similar case I can think of. But um, 
I can't imagine with the business on one side of the street and all the parking. I realize the city's moving away in April, but there's DHS. Yes. There's a whole, like, but uh, soil and plant, with soil and- Water conservation yeah. district, yeah. So with those all, and then Lexar Homes, and then a financial firm, I can't imagine that on one side of the street and it would be legit to prove 10 people in the house, especially if the, supposedly they weren't going to be driving, but if they have 10 cars or, you know, in a 1,700 square foot home, approximately 6,000 square foot lot, that, that would, I mean, I realize you can't discriminate on who lives in what house and they don't have to be related, but I mean, none of us, I mean, it seems like a lot of congestion because like a family residence, you only have so many cars. Yeah. I've got a question. <clears throat> Why isn't this a land use issue? I mean, who's sponsoring this? So we're still going through code enforcement, so I'd, I'd rather prefer not to get into any well, details. Well, all we gotta do is look but at the zoning ordinance and say, hey, this is a conditional use or an expansion of a conditional use. Somebody, some governmental institution's gotta be sponsoring this, and if that's the case, wouldn't it be like a, yes. uh, a, a church or a school or exactly. some sort of vocational type of a thing where it would require a use permit from the city through us? It, it may or may not require a use, a well, conditional use. Well, can we get some sort defense. of a, a report to yeah. give us information? Um, well, so I'm working on it through the code enforcement process. And so when we're done gathering information and making assessment, if they need a conditional use, then they would we either stop doing that or get a conditional in use. Our code, I know that we were not allowed to, and we wouldn't as a city discriminate, but you know, it's basically five or fewer before it becomes a group home or something to that effect? I'd rather not dive into the details again. Yeah. It's I'm just asking a bit about, more I'm complex. I'm asking about the details. I'm asking about the code section. Do we still have that in our code or is there some other? No, provision? there's nothing in the planning code that limits the amount of people in a house. Um, there, when it talks about caring for, then there is the five or fewer. Yeah, for example, you could think of like a senior care facility yeah, well, or something like that. I'm also thinking that. about occupancy. There's only so much space that a place can actually capacity. And, but anyway, and, thank you. We're, we're going to move on. Okay. Thank you very yeah, much and, for and, listening. And what I would say is you're doing the right thing. You're talking to people. I mean, one of the worst things that, that we run into, yes. both when I was on city commission and um, here on the planning commission, is people that just stew until it explodes. You've reached out. You've talked to people. You're staying on top of it and keeping people aware of it. That's exactly the thing to do. And if you know people move in there and they cause trouble, call the police. You know, I mean, it's it may <laughs> they may not show up immediately, but um, that's you know you're doing the right thing by reaching out and trying to, to fix it and not just waiting for something okay. to just go catastrophically wrong. And continue to and thank check you in for with doing Chief that. Band. I just feel bad for these women on top of it because whether the organization we don't trust based on what we've seen and heard, the organization running it. But these poor women, these sobriety women, you know, they're being thrown out to the wolves, you know, like they're trying to, you know, and there's still room, you know, there's really no room in 1,700 square feet, even for like five people. Yeah, well, if, if we can do anything to mitigate, we will do what we, we can. Thank you very much. Um, and what we needed to know about it. If you want it, to talk, you. you have to come back up. We can't have comments from the audience. Oh, okay. So, Come on back up if you okay. want to come back up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It just doesn't get picked up by, you know, we're on live TV. And no, I appreciate that. that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention. And just say your name again. Jennifer Lance, yes. um, Oregon City. And so the group that's intent on moving in there um, had, I think Martin may have mentioned that earlier, um, but I just wanted to clarify, they had um, posted a, a public post on social media today saying that they're having this cleaning party tomorrow night and that this women's house has opened and they're moving in. So for me, it was a little bit like, okay, were they told information that we have not yet been told or, or what's happening? So I'm just wondering, I know I kind of talked with you about that this afternoon, but you know, you had said, well, it sounds like they're just having a cleaning party and that might be okay. Um, Keep an eye on them. Keep an eye on them. Oh, okay, but rereading it after we spoke, I mean, they very clearly said, we're moving in, that has everyone heard, or something to that effect. So that's where it's like, 
had they been told a decision and we haven't, or I don't understand why that would be, you know, because they're advertising to the world on social media, come over and help us move in. <laughs> Are they prohibited from occupying at this point in time? Yeah. Sorry. We're still working, we're still working through the code enforcement process at this time. Okay. Okay. So, okay, so, but we shouldn't do anything if we see them come over and start living there. We should just wait. No, you're always more than welcome to give us information. Okay. What we do with that during th the code enforcement process before we make a determination if there's a violation or not is a little bit different, but always feed us information. Okay. Okay. So just. So let me ask you one more time. I'm going to ask her, so thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, are they allowed to occupy at this point in time? I'd rather not get into the details till we're done with it. Thank I guess you. my 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 question is, is is it either a yes or a no or is it a maybe? I mean, if you're investigating and they're doing something that you don't know whether or not they're doing it, it seems to me that Bill, I know you're going to answer try to answer the question. So my question is, there's a permitted single family residential dwelling on that on right. that lot. They can use it for single-family dwelling uh, appropriate uses. There is federal law overlay about what the yes. city can and can't right. to allow. So could they occupy that? Yeah, they could occupy it with uses that are allowed under our code uh, with that federal law overlay. If they're doing more than that, no, they can't. And so that's part of the investigation. What is it that's actually occurring right. on the site? And, and, and that's what I wanted you to say so that they could hear it. I okay. didn't really want to answer the question. I kind of knew what the answer was, but again, I didn't want to just to say if it's this, it's this. If it's not, it's not. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, folks, um, let's move on to the next agenda items. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. Thank you. Keep talking to Chief Ban. Keep talking to Community Development. Document, document, document. All right, well, we have a, uh, we have some public hearings tonight. We have a legislative code amendment. We have another legislative code amendment and we have a regular public hearing. So I only have to read the thing once and that's when we get to 3B, but I don't have to read it for 3A. So we have on the agenda tonight, um, file number LE1703. It's a legislative amendment to amend chapter 1204205 of the Oregon City Municipal Code to establish alternative mobility standards for Highway 213 intersection at Beaver Creek and to amend the transportation, here go the lights, transportation systems plan project list. Uh, so since it's not really a land use hearing, we're, it's a continued item. Everybody is on the commission is familiar with it. We've been on 213 many times. We don't have any conflicts as far as I'm aware. Just yeah, did your, okay, hang on just a second. His screen just got wonky well, again. Okay. So while he's working on the screen, yeah. as I understand it, it is the first hearing. And because it's legislative, we've got conflict issues to worry about, but not bias or ex parte right. contacts. So, you know, uh, that's. I just, I just asked him again. Okay. So we could do, like I said, I only have to read the thing once. So we have, and everybody, everybody can see that. All right. So we are uh, awaiting the staff report. John, are you doing that? Or Kelly, are you introducing and then John's chipping in later? I'm going to introduce. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Thank you. So, and just to make clear, sorry, I'm, there are no conflicts to declare. Is that correct? I, I, I asked them all, and nobody had anything to declare. Thank you. Do you have anything to declare? No, okay. I didn't That's what ask. I, yes, I did ask. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Chair McGriff. Um, Kelly Reed, Planner, Oregon City. Uh, this is a continuation of the public hearing that we began January 22nd, about a month ago. Uh, and I just want to clarify that um, alternate mobility targets is interchangeable with alternate mobility standards. So if we are using different terminology, um, just know that we're talking about the same thing. And so in summary, uh, this legislative file would amend our comforts of plan by amending the transportation system plan project list uh, and would also amend our code, uh, chapter 12 and section 1204-205 uh, to adopt these targets for the intersection of Highway 213 and Beaver Creek Road. 
uh, and this is based on the Oregon Highway Plan, which allows for use of alternative mobility targets throughout the state. Uh, there were a number of issues that were brought up at last meeting. Um, we the the applicant's presentation will respond to each issue raised, um, but I just want to quickly uh, point out a couple of changes that resulted from some of those topics. And um, one is that we did get confirmation from ODOT uh, that uh, what we talked about last time that um, we had originally planned on Beaver Creek Road and Redland Road intersections being involved in this project. And now um, it is confirmed that we are only looking at Beaver Creek Road uh, for alternate mobility targets. The Redland Road intersection does not require uh, alternative mobility targets. Um, and so there are no changes proposed there. We're retaining the, um, the improvement project that we've been planning on for that intersection. So no change there. Uh, the other change that resulted from the issues that were brought up at last meeting uh, was that we added um, a TSP project change to the list of um, new TSP projects uh, just to bring some consistency to one of our shared use path projects. And so to summarize those TSP project list amendments, the first three uh, are improvements at the Beaver Creek Road intersection. And then the last one uh, has been added, uh, which is an existing project S13 shared use path um, Newell Creek Canyon Holly Lane shared use path and so the uh, amendments there that you see in in strike through and underline are just bringing that project description in alignment with the regional transportation plan which also has this project uh, in it in a slightly different form so we just wanted to make sure that those matched up the local and the regional plan now will match uh, with this change that we're proposing so I think probably better when we get to the end, you'll have to clarify. Yes. I see several commissioners scratching their Sure. Heads. Yeah, we're, we'll go through each of the issues that were brought up um, in greater detail. Not issues. I just heard today that there was plan change. And all of a sudden, now I'm only seeing 213 in Beaver Creek. And as I mentioned earlier, I thought we something had changed about Redland in 213. And so this surprised me that it's only Beaver Creek here. Yes, last hearing, uh, we had just received word from ODOT that the Redland Road intersection will um, be able to uh, show, meet TPR or meet um, our targets, our existing targets that are on the books now um, because the improvement project at Redland is on um, the regional transportation project list and is a funded project. And so we don't, we are not required to actually make changes uh, in our local code in order to um, um, be able to meet mobility targets at Redwood. We'll be able to meet them as is. And we had previously not understood that uh, and no one had brought that up until kind of the last minute right before last hearing. I'm still lost because I, yeah, it's complicated. I mentioned to them, I saw something tonight that was shown to me at the park place, uh, never that, that apparently the 213 and Redland Road was going to be um, sent through and gone through. And now you're saying it, it meets mobility and so it's not going to be included. So someone needs to clarify, I can clarify a little bit for you. For anybody out here. Yeah, so originally, so alternate mobility targets, this whole project in general was, was Remember when we did our transportation system plan, uh, when we do that, we have this obligation to make sure that we meet a certain level of congestion. So mobility targets is the jargon. And um, there are a couple of places where um, Beaver Creek and 213, at that point, um, we realized that the fix to meet our mobility targets was really expensive. Now it's upwards of $50 million. And so knowing that we don't have $50 million in our back pocket, that's Which what led to this. I'm sorry, I didn't read which. What? Which one was 50 million? Beaver said? Creek in 213. Okay, and then um, when we went through, we had identified a corridor for alternate mobility targets, which started at Redland and went through Beaver Creek in 213. Um, there was a project as a part of Beaver Creek in 213 that made it into our regional transportation um, plan. And because of that, uh, it 
is it will have some funding associated with it so we could assume that it's reasonably likely to be built it's about a 10 million dollar project it was part of the jug handle but kind of leftover pieces that Laura, never got built you said beaver creek in 213 you meant redland, redland. 213. you are on it <laughs> yes so we thought that we were moving down the road for alternate mobility targets because we were uncertain the ability to construct the 10 or so million dollar project for Redland in 213. Now we are more certain since it's in the RTP. And so we are not asking for the city to accept a higher level of congestion for Redland in 213. We're just going to leave it alone. And we're just focusing on Beaver Creek in 213. So is that our responsibility to build it? Or since it's on the state list, it's the state, the state is going to build it? Or is it a partnership? <laughs> What's not these days, right? Um, so it's on the RTP, so there there is funding associated with that. But um, John can talk a little bit more to the extent of the, how that funding comes into play. Well, so I guess what? Are we building it or are they building it? Are you talking about Redland or Beaver? Redland. 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 I'm talking about Redland. Redland. So how about if I? How about if I try? Because I thought I tried last time, and well, we obviously we didn't are get building through it this. Or we aren't building. Well, John, you said something last time, but then it all changed when I saw this. This post that I saw tonight on somebody's phone showed it to me at the park place meeting that, hey, it looks like the, the Redland Road is back on the... Social uh, media is probably one of the most misleading places state. to get your news, Mr. Guile, that you can pick. State, not I have not seen a I don't get my news social from, post from social media, I can tell you that. in many, many moons. So I'm just going to tell you, base, same thing we mentioned last time. We are removing the Redland and 213 project from the alternate mobilities because remember, alternate mobil mo mobility targets or standards are about changing the standard, right? They're, they're, they're saying we're gonna, in this case, live with more congestion, right? At Redland and 213, this, the standard there, for one, we, ha we get to, um, the standard is a little bit higher. In other words, it already allows for more congestion there because it's inside of our, re an area designated as a regional center. So at Redland and 213, it's already at a higher standard, which allows for a higher number standard. So it allows for more congestion. We, and because of that, it meets the projection for full build out for Oregon City. And because of that, we are not asking the state to change the standard anymore. Now, the project itself is in the regional plan and it's likely to be funded in the regional plan. Nobody's saying right now, we've got a pot of money to pay for that project, but the theory is that somewhere, whether it be a legislative fix, whether it be uh, a, a grant program that we then apply for and get that project, it's on the list. So it gives us the capability to go ahead and be able to pay for that. Now, typically that would mean the city would apply for that. So to, to talk to Denise's question, who's gonna build it? Well, it is a, a state highway project. We'd always love for the state highway to take on these projects. That hasn't been the experience that we've had in quite some time. Usually it's up to the city to push for that project, to fight for that project, to try to get the funding available for that project. And often we have to deliver those projects. So, um, you know, that's, that's the best we have that we can share in terms of who's going to deliver the project. I don't know today. I'm not even sure when the funding would come available. I think it's a good project. I think it's one that everybody recognizes as a need. It's just not hitting the standard, or it's not hitting, I'm not going to use the word standard, it's not hitting the priority that there are in other places across the state where higher needs are at, okay? So does that make sense? No. But <laughs> still, still didn't answer my question. He did. Kind I of. think I did. Well, you want to know who's going to build it? Yeah. Right. Okay. So I'll say it again. At this point in time, we don't necessarily n n know where the money's coming from, but we do know that these our history of state improvement projects on state facilities requires the city to fight, to go out and apply for, to put all the justification together. Usually we do that in a partnership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, the jug handle is a great example of that. We get multiple agencies on board and everybody's supporting it, right? I hope that that happens with this project as well, but I have no guarantees, but I suspect it's gonna be the city that's gonna be the advocate for that. We may even be the ones managing that project. 
Um, you are still but, talking about the Beaver Creek. Yeah, Sorry, yeah about managing, Redland. managing, Redland. Is, Redland. Redland, Redland is one yeah. thing, you know. Redland well, Road. Well, do you yeah. mean who's going to build it? I don't even know. The contractor? Well, what, what, I what meant, are you trying to... I what mean, I meant by who's building it is the city of Oregon City paying to build this project, or are we getting money, hopefully going to get money from the state to build it? As far as I can tell, the city of Oregon City can't afford to build this project on its own. In fact, we've, we've included a small piece of a match in our transportation SDC project list, but it's a very small piece of that. So most of that money's got to come from somewhere else right. for us to build it. Okay. All right. Okay. John, before we move on, didn't, don't want to interrupt your, your train of thought here, but that's what I heard earlier, and it was, they showed me something that was obviously, they said, from Oregon State Transportation. But I wanted to clarify for the quote that I'll be using when we go to the concept plan and the annexations. You just said that, that, that we can live with more congestion at the Redland Road, and they, our, the code already, already allows for higher standards at the Redland and 213 or Redland and Oakham. Isn't that what you just it, said? It allows for... Um, so if you compare the um, two intersections, the Beaver Creek intersection with the Redland intersection, because the Redland intersection is inside of our uh, regional town center, mm -hmm. right? It's a specific area that's designated. And any intersections within those designated areas, the, the state has already adopted a standard that allows for more congestion. Does that make sense? Right. And you said meets with full build out. So in other words, with 1,400 homes, plan and park place concept plan, the airport, the Sears farm area, all those build outs, that's considering all those build outs. That's right. That we can live with that 213. The, the modeling we've Redmond. seen shows that it'll, it'll be, there'll be times of congestion, right? It'll be, t there'll be yeah, more, con <laughs> okay. Maybe it'll take you two or three cycles to get through that intersection as opposed to free flowing. Yeah. Right. Well, that's, but just to be clear, that's a shock. It's not the way the intersection is today. It's the way the intersection is planned to be when this $10 million project gets completed. Right. That's when it'll meet build out. Right. So um, you've taken it off, off our list for this mobility because the fix is already, and this is going to sound wrong, but the fix is already <laughs> in. <laughs> um, it's, it's just uh, so you, we don't need to plan for it because it's already been planned. Ex planned and accepted by all parties. You just need money to rain from the sky. Right. Um, as opposed to Beaver Creek, where um, there isn't a plan, and we're trying to figure out the plan and what is an acceptable plan. So yeah. that's why we're now looking just at Beaver Creek because Redland theoretically already has a fix in place. It's just a timing issue versus a funding timing right. issue versus right. a planning issue. That's right. Okay. But there is no fix, actually, because the last time we reported, John said 1.1, I think you reported. I don't have the figure in front of me. Um, at that intersection, was that what you said last time? I oh, can't remember. Yeah, the, the, the congestion. Yeah. It's already over 1. It's a 1.1, 1. 1 and with all the other homes, it could go up higher and higher and higher, 1.9. But Okay, go on with your... I'm just concerned about Redland. It just seems to be focusing all up on the river Creek and not where all the construction is going to come. Okay. Uh, so this is the uh, project that's being proposed. Um, it's this uh, D95 uh, westbound right turn merge lane on Beaver Creek to 213. And we talked about this last time, so I'm not going to get into details. Uh, the code amendment that's on the table here um, would focus on that chapter 12. Uh, it would say that during the first, second, and third hours, uh, maximum v, v over C ratio, which is volume to capacity ratio of 1.00 shall be maintained. And the calculation of that will be based on the average annual weekday peak hour. Uh, current, the current code is 0.99. And it is uh, based on the 30th highest hour rather than the average annual hour. Um, so in the box below, you see the scenario. Um, the first <coughs> row is existing, um, the existing intersection design. Uh, this would be in the year 2035. Um, you know, we'd see congestion levels above 1.1. Um, for three, four hours 
of the day um, with the right turn merge lane uh, it, there's actually just one hour um, that uh, is at that 1.0 and so that right turn merge lane actually does add quite a bit of capacity to the intersection uh, and then um, the small which means we only have to change the mobility standard very very slightly and so again the approval criteria includes our transportation system plan and chapter 1768 zone changes and amendments uh, which refers to our comprehensive plan goals and policies all of these uh, findings of compliance are in your staff report and we talked a little bit about them last time uh, in addition to our local code and plan uh, statewide planning goals and statewide plans are also approval criteria and so we have findings uh, for compliance with those plans in your staff report as well uh, and with that I think John and I will walk through that issues matrix that is based on um, the I think 11 or so issues that were brought up at the last hearing and so we'll go through that uh, and um, please feel free to ask questions. Just digging through the report here, Dana found for me that um, the OR213 or in Redland Road, so that same, go back to that chart with the, the, so if we look at those same, the times may be a little different, but kind of that same layout for Redland Road, what we showed you before was with out the additional through lanes at Redland and 213. So no change at the at full build out. We would go to a, a volume over capacity ratio of 1.1, which is allowed under the current standard during the first hour. And during the second hour, it would go to 1.09. And during the third hour, it would go to 1.04. And um, that's without without the addition of the two new through lanes. Okay, if we spend another ten million on that intersection and put in those two new through lanes, that, those numbers go down significantly. So that's why we're we still have the project in there. We're still going to continue to monitor it. Doesn't have as probably as high a priority as other places across the state, but it's within the standard, and that's what ODOT. That combined with the with the leaving the project on the list as John, well. could you define for me what full build out means? Means the 20, um, 2035 plan, which assumes all those growth areas in Oregon City under the current urban service boundary are developed. Okay, so with all the annexations that are coming in, the yep. one that we're all those considering all those that are in the park okay. place concept area. South End concept area and Beaver Creek concept and area. So this road can handle all the traffic at these congestion levels during certain hours. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just to clarify, when they do those models, they put them into a regional model. So we're not looking at Oregon City in a bubble. We're also looking at how the region itself is growing. But of course, we never know when you've got, let's say, 1,400 homes and you've got airstrips, you've got this and that. You don't know how many cars that's actually going to put there you should know how many kids or students are we, we do full build out average. projections so we we assume in 2035 the whole region is built out so we all put our zoning designations in and it calculates um, how many units there will be if everyone is built out and they put that in the model hmm. disagree but okay <laughs> when you say model are you talking about a computer model mm -hmm. yeah we do a metro regional model mm -hmm. Yeah, an exact science. Mm, yeah, to no, right. live out Redland Road. And we're talking about uh, uh, water, sewer, traffic, things like that. We were just talking about traffic right now. Just, just traffic. Um, with the concept plans, those look at all those other, and our um, utility master plans look at all the other ones as well. <clears throat> okay. I get that some people are concerned about it. Love you, John. <laughs> and we all are, well, there are many of us are, but I, I just think that um, we're concerned and we're I gonna, would say somewhat skeptical. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there were, what you say, 11 items here that we're going to try and talk through, and um, I'm going to talk about the specific concerns. So, um, 
thank you, Kelly, for putting my notes together for me because this helps a bunch. So um, clarify why the displaced left turn ideas uh, were not brought forward. And this drawing is very hard to read. I get that. Um, it was, a lot of this was discussed. The idea is for the displaced left turn, I'm going to try to describe it to you. But the purple lines on this map represent um, really those folks that are southbound on Beaver Creek want, wanting to make the left turn onto, um, uh, I'm sorry, southbound on Highway 213 wanting to make the left turn to go eastbound on Beaver Creek Road. And that's a big movement. That's one of the, that's, that's one of the two bigger movements, right? The other left turn is off of Beaver Creek turning on to 213 northbound. So, um, under this scenario, the design was suggested that we use this, this um, displaced left, which puts people into a, a turn pocket on Highway 213. It probably starts back much further than the existing one starts. They come to a signal well before the existing signalized intersection, and they would have the opportunity under a signalized scenario to cross over that traffic that's headed northbound on 213 and then they come they, they run in south on the east side of the northbound traffic and they come to the intersection where they would then make the left so the intersection timing and the transitional uh, movements there um, have proven to be uh, a way to move more traffic for this location, it, everything seemed too tight, just too close together. Although um, Kittleson and Associates still felt like it had some merit to it, as the um, committees, the, the Community Advisory Committee and the Technical Advisory Committee looked at it, there was skepticism, I would say. So I'll, I'll use your term, uh, Commissioner McGriff. Uh, this, this alternative, there was lots of skepticism about whether it would work. The other thing it does is it incorporates a free-flowing um, right turn off of Beaver Creek to northbound 213. Um, so we did talk about it. Uh, the question was at the last uh, meeting was why didn't we look at this harder? You know, this is the, there. There's really not one of these in the state of Oregon right now. So that was another kind of success factor that we were a little bit worried about. So. So we just wanted to bring that back and let you know we did look at it. Um, ODOT was not really willing to go there either on this location. So even if the committees would have, it like, seemed like they were the ones pushing it when the meetings. But uh, well, Kittleson was pushing Kittleson it. Kittleson so was. That it ODOT, was ODOT. ODOT necessarily wasn't. Okay. So um, let's go to the next slide. The other question was clarify why the half diamond was not considered um, or brought forward into the discussion. And so the Half Diamond uh, really was a very expensive uh, project. While in what would be the northeast quadrant, there, you know, it's a vacant land. There's, you know, plenty of opportunity to do that kind of a, an improvement. On the um, northwest side, you know, we're into Newell Canyon there. There's a lot of grade change there. So we basically see uh, an on off ramp, if you will, that would be elevated quite high off the ground and into what we know to be kind of a geologic hazard area. It's and a natural bridge. resource area. It's basically full bridge the whole way. It would be a full bridge the whole way. Um, the other thing that I think is challenging about this kind of scenario is um, making 213 higher than Beaver Creek Road. You know, we'd either have to take Beaver Creek Road down several feet or bring 213 up or a little of both. And, uh, you know, just the transitions on 213 alone to try and get it high enough to go up and over would be significant. Well, I think that was the problem is it's, it's Beaver Creek that should be above 213. Either way, we've get, we end up with problems, right? Yeah, but, yeah. but Beaver Creek's already above 213, so. But yeah, there is. There is issues. I won't deny that. But. <laughs> so I, the other thing is this, this eliminates quite a few movements. It would force certain movements to go to another intersection. For instance, if you're northbound on 213, there's really not a, not a way to get off of this interchange in the, in the half diamond interchange. 
And if you're on Beaver Creek and you want to go southbound, you would need to use a different intersection. This, this alternative didn't provide for that movement. So, you know, I think, again, this one wasn't considered very much. It was discussed, but wasn't considered a lot. Let's see. Yeah, so Kelly, Kelly and I talked through this, and she thought sh she did the most homework on this one, so I asked her if she could cover this one. Uh, so last hearing we heard about this 1993 agreement between the city, the county, and ODOT um, that we all agreed to build an aggregate intersection, um, or sorry, a grade separated um, interchange here. Uh, and, you know, I think the question was really what happened we had, if we had an agreement to do it, um, why can't we do that again? Or um, what happened to that? Uh, so we did um, pull some old meeting minutes from the 90s and we looked at some memorandums from our city attorneys um, from back then. And it appears that the county, uh, the agreement was inked um, and it was not yet effective. Uh, and so right after that agreement um, was approved, the county requested a change uh, they wanted the city to um, additionally commit to denying any new development at the intersection uh, if traffic analysis demonstrated that the intersection wouldn't operate at a, a level of service D or better, which used to be the way we measured congestion, level of service. Uh, and uh, the city ha had some concerns over that request. Um, we rescinded our approval of the agreement uh, in May of 93 and then we looked forward a few years and it, it, there wasn't any evidence that uh, there was a replacement agreement or any sort of renegotiation with the county uh, and so it seemed to have ended there uh, however the city did um, up, update or adopt a transportation system plan in 2001 uh, and um, in 2000, right before that, we completed a Highway 213 corridor study. And through those two studies and processes, we identified an improvement project uh, to, um, to improve the at-grade intersection. And that's what you see on your screen here. So the um, lighter colored photo is 2003. Uh, and then 2004, um, after we completed that, upgrade. Uh, we added lanes, um, we added sidewalks, or we added right turn lanes and we added sidewalks. Um, this project, uh, and it, that included a signal modification as well, uh, this project cost 5.45 million. Um, the city paid about half of that uh, through urban renewal. And um, it seems as though we did get some assistance from our other agencies. Um, the 2001 TSP, so planned for this project, but also included a long-term project for the diamond interchange. Uh, and the, the TSP identified that project, said it would cost 20 million, uh, and you know identified it as a future project that would be needed when the intersection no longer met the standards. Um, the corridor study said, a, you know, was very similar findings um, that we would have to consider the grade separated interchange uh, in the future if we didn't meet the meet the congestion targets. Um, then in 2013, when we updated our TSP, uh, we looked at our 2001 TSP. We saw this interchange project uh, that was planned or projected at $20 million. Um, we realized that it's really going to cost a lot, lot more than that, and that we couldn't afford it. And so we, uh, that was one reason why we eliminated it from uh, the project list for 2013. Um, and the reasons cited in 2013 were uh, livability issues, uh, multimodal access, um, and funding constraints. Uh, and so the 2013 TSP called for alternative mobility targets for this intersection, and um, and said that the interchange project would be reconsidered uh, beyond the 2035 planning horizon if targets cannot be met. Um, so that's kind of where we were at before coming, uh, doing this alternate mobility study. Okay. Any 
anything else? For that item, yes. no. That's okay. covers the 1993 agreement question. Okay. Unless you have any more questions. You want to go to the next slide? Yeah. So uh, the picture up on the top was um, provided as part of test, uh, the public testimony for January 22nd hearing. Just wanted to point out that that is an older photo, um, although not that much older. <laughs> so uh, just this last summer, ODOT and the city met uh, to discuss the problem with what was similar, uh, may have been even a little worse in the picture that's shown above, and ODOT came in, ODOT maintenance crews came in, and they've done a lot of the, what you're seeing in the bottom slides, which uh, dissipate a lot of the rainwater, and um, the sandbags aren't there anymore. The, I think that was just during construction, but um, they've since repaired that. Um, repaired it in a sense that, the, that it uh, dissipates the energy and uh, will abs absorb a lot of the energy and not necessarily a road like what you're seeing here um, in the upper picture. So again, that's always going to be one of those maintenance items that I think it's going to have to, you know, the ODOT's going to need to keep an eye on. But uh, at this point, it's in much better condition. Uh, there was also some concern about fish passage. And what I can tell you from um, my hiking up and through the, down through that canyon <coughs> is there's a significant grade drop that doesn't necessarily lend itself to pools and resting places for spawning fish. Um, other um, um, uh, fish, the Wow. I'm thinking of lamprey eels, those kind of uh, those kind of migrating uh, um, amphibious uh, creatures or whatever they. I'm not an environmentalist, but there may be other options uh, for them in the future. I think any project that were say to touch that side of the creek, uh, if there were say this um, great separated interchange that needed to go out in there, would definitely take care of that uh, or consider what really those concerns are and whether or not um, they should be addressed. But um, at this time, we're thinking the ODOT repair is adequate for what the needs were for that problem. John, can I ask you a question about it? Sure. Uh, the three at the bottom, um, I take it when this was a free flowing stream that it could cut, because no creek, we know the history, but that that could have caused some problems with too much water going into that area, so they put these pipes in. Is that a correct assumption? These I see up above there was those, but now I see there's another a pipe down below here. Is that to take it down lower somewhere where else to let the water flow? I think you just, they're all the same pipes, so you're just looking at them at different angles. different angles. They all come from different locations uh, on either the other side of the ODOT highway, so say the- um, Sherry's area. Yeah, Sherry's or, or, or the, the area from the community college. Are they creek flow or are they uh, run off from the roads with oil and, um, and things? Both. So the, uh, the larger diameter pipe there. So if we're looking at the lower, I'm going to do this from memory, but thanks. And does that flow into a creek down below? So this, this pipe here, which is in the lower left picture, lower left pipe, that's what that's bringing it mostly from Newell Creek and what comes from the community college. Um, this one here, I believe, comes from where the storage, um, RV storage area is. Uh, the one in the middle, I believe, comes from just the uh, street runoff right there, localized yeah, so to the intersection. And then it's this one close. here. This one here is. Um, oh, it may come from drainage, kind of up Beaver Creek Roadway. So it's not a drainage to take the water down the hill necessarily. This one right here, the bottom one. These are all outfalls, and there's no pipe that takes it down. It free flows down into the creek itself. Uh, into it once it, creek, once so. it leaves these pipes, it all gravity flows down. If you look, at, I mean. If you look at the picture up top, they, all, those are all the same pipes, and they come down here, which is right about here, which I think is about here on this picture, and they, they, they it's bedrock down there, so you're seeing just so basically question, flows along the creek, the original creek alignment. My thought was, okay, so this all flows, and we've got that resolved. Fish may not make it up here, but does all that runoff from the roads and the parking lots all go down into Abernathy Creek, where the, they're always telling us not to put things into the creeks, and does all that run off from the roads and the it parking does. lots yep. get into Abernathy Creek? All the way from the golf course to 
Well, okay. let's see. The golf, just course, to clarify. the golf course runoff is Caulfield Creek. So this is more from the community college and the high school, some of the high okay. school. And this through, through this drainage way. All right. This isn't any part of any changes. This is just what's existing. Right. Yeah. And uh, we also included in your matrix, um, just as an explanation, uh, that any improvements to the intersection, any widening, any ad addition of pavement um, that's in our natural resource overlay, uh, which you know is kind of on either side of Newell Creek, and so we're kind of in our in our natural resource overlay area here. Um, the widening that would occur through the right turn merge lane project would be reviewed through our natural resource overlay process and would have to um, provide mitigation for any new impervious surface. And so just like any other project, uh, we would provide that, make sure that mitigation is provided and we would meet our own code as far as natural resources go. Thank you. So this one's about bike routes and some of the comments that were there. There was um, three that we noted are the planned bike routes in the area still a possibility. Uh, would like to see a separated bike route to the high school along the south side of Beaver Creek Road. Um, and then I, this one's more of a comment. I think there's a shared use path planned parallel to Highway 213 that could provide a bike route all the way to Washington Street. So, um, the, I guess the main, big picture is we're not, there's not really any changes planned to the bike and trail TSP pro, um, projects as proposed, so we're, we're using those other than we're, adi we're um, the addition of the shared use path, and we're going to explain that to you, but wayfinding signage and bike lane improvements on Beaver Creek Road are proposed as part of the TSP project W84, so I think that takes it um, through the, the project site out towards um, the high school. Um, so all the existing bike lanes and paths that are in the transportation system plan would be retained. Um, the current plan for Beaver Creek Road includes bike lanes and sidewalks all the way south past the high school. As properties along Beaver Creek Road redeveloped, city staff will work with developers on the design details for the street improvements. Through the land use process, staff has the ability to modify the design of street improvements and could potentially include a separated bike path instead of a bike lane on street on the street. Um, modification would be uh, type two process through chapter twelve in our code. Um, the planned shared use path um, parallels two thirteen is a project in the regional transportation plan, and I. Uh, um, it's got a, that project numbers listed up there, wasn't it? I thought I saw it up there. Yeah, so RTP project 10147. Um, and it's in the city's trails master plan. The full path, path is currently not in our TSP project list. So that was something that we found as a result of this, just researching the two, the old, the old project that was listed and showed um, that bike and shared path along Holly Lane. Is that correct? Is that the one that we, and rather than leave it there, we have made the adjustment to put it in the alignment that shows it kind of meandering um, between Holly Lane and Highway 213. I think that's on the old, part of that's on the old railroad grade. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, Metro has been acquiring property back there. I think there's a lot of momentum moving in the direction of actually getting that pathway put in. So um, hopefully in the next five to 10 years, we'll see something along there. Um, so Kelly's initiated the changes to the TSP. So that will be um, forthcoming. So that was a good comment. Let's see. I'm going to go, I'm going to come back to this. So issue 10, we're skipping issues here okay. for no particular reason, but the, um, some of them have, we have slides for, other ones we don't. So I'll go back to the various issues that we don't have a slide for at the end. So funding constraints, why can't ODOT or the county fund these improvements? And the other question is the city should demand that ODOT help with costs um, should build the full interchange improvements as soon as possible. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we had that kind of power? We, we really don't have that kind of power. 
And, um, you know, funding across the region is just a challenge, for, especially for these bigger projects. So um, we're kind of showing on the, the left there the transportation needs in the city and some of the funding uh, concerns we had or we have. As many of you or some of you may know, the City Commission just approved a transportation system development charge rate increase effective July 1. So we're moving closer and closer to being able to fund all of our capacity related projects in the TSP, um, but not everything, right? And really, so that $10 million project that we talked about on Redland Road, we just looked at a couple of scenarios for how you might fund $10 million worth of transportation projects. So if we took all the current households in, in Oregon City and split that cost up, um, as a one-time charge, it would be $769 per dwelling unit. I suppose there's a way to do that over time as well, but um, we also have that voter approved. Um, any kind of debt indebtedness, it's gotta be voter approved. So probably be unsuccessful with that. Um, if we just put it on new households that are coming to town and uh, raise the uh, SDC, that's, Let's see, is that right? Projected new households, 8,000, yeah. That would be uh, $1,250 per dwelling unit. On the new units? On the new units. And then uh, if we looked at all of them, existing and new, and had a, had a charge across the board, it would be $476 per dwelling unit. So those aren't small numbers. Most folks would struggle with those. Uh, obviously, we have a little better time dealing with the new development because it gets kind of built into the cost of the house, but we've also been talking a fair amount about affordable housing, so I'm not quite sure. Well, I think I am sure how we balance that. We do it in increments that we can handle, and um, to fund all the projects in the TSP, we just threw that um, SDC adjustment that the commission authorized on Wednesday. That was about a $1,600 per uh, peak hour trip charge that our SDCs go up. So um, that is that would be charged against any new, um, well, any new development, but that, that particular number is pretty specific to a single family home. So John, isn't it true that SDCs collected from new development don't necessarily stay in that particular area to help fund things, that they're going to a general fund? So that 1250 per dwelling unit really isn't coming out of the new development that's that might be money going into a, a pot, but it doesn't necessarily go to improve the roads? Like no, that's no. completely wrong. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no. Clarify um, for me, will you? Any transportation SDC projects are dedicated funds, and they're held in a dedicated account for growth-related <coughs> projects, right? So... In that particular area? In the city. In the city, but not in that area where they're collected from. Uh, that's These were collected, let's say, in one particular area. Right. They don't stay in that area. They go into. So, the if new city. development happens in in McLaughlin neighborhood, mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's going to be spent on a project in the McLaughlin that's neighborhood. That's it could be spent in Park Place or South End or Beaver Creek. Yeah. So again, it's, what, it's, I was, what I was trying to say is that SDCs from a new development don't necessarily stay right in that one little particular area. It goes into Oregon City, but it's not just for roads in that particular development. Area. That's true. That's, That's what true. I wanted to clarify. Okay. I wanted to quote you on that exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so funding's okay. a challenge. Of course. <clears throat> uh, let's see, this one's slide eight. Got to go back. So with regard to volume and capacity, I know this is getting long, what does the volume and capacity one feel like? Aren't we just going to exceed this, the standard in a few years and be back where we are started? Those are a couple comments. So really trying to, trying to get people to understand what that might mean, what's the volume to capacity of one mean or 1.1 mean. So we asked Kilson to put this slide together and we shared it with our community advisory group and the technical advisory group. So in terms of travel time, <clears throat> this is the travel time through 213 and Beaver Creek Road. So they looked at the average, which is in blue, and that shows that generally it takes about a minute and a half to get through um, that intersection today on average. And at full build out, uh, volume capacity of, well, 
That, that must not be full build out. That must be, that was the 85, uh, that was the 85th percentile, at, yeah, for today. So um, that gets you up to almost three minutes through that intersection. So twice as long as it takes you under an average kind of condition. Other than that, it's difficult to, I don't, I, we've thought about, it's a couple of cycles, three, maybe three cycles of, of you know, red, green, and yellow through the intersection. That's what it would feel like. Kelly, you wanna go sure. through this one? Um, one of our public comments that we received uh, was about the Seaside, Oregon, which also has alternate mobility uh, standards. And so we um, looked at the documentation there uh, and we actually called Seaside to see, um, to make sure that, that what they had proposed was approved by the Oregon Transportation Commission and was in effect and they were kind of using these new standards. They said, yes, it was. Uh, and so they were looking at um, Highway 101, uh, which ha you know has different congestion issues than Oregon City. You know, it's more of a seasonal thing um, in Seaside, but uh, they proposed uh, standards of 1.0 uh, for four intersections along that highway. Uh, and they also proposed to use the average annual um, uh, hour. <laughs> yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Our yeah. average annual time. Um, and uh, th one of these intersections, I think US 101 and Broadway, the third one on the list there, uh, is the, dur the duration for that um, standard in place of one is three hours, which is really exactly what we're proposing here um, for Beaver Creek is three hours of uh, 1.0 uh, using the average annual conditions. Uh, and so that was approved by OTC um, sometime, sometime after 2011, because this um, their proposal uh, was done in 2011, and and since then it's been approved, and they're using it. And so um, I think it was nice to hear that another jurisdiction had had success uh, with this at the Transportation Commission. I just want to be clear from your slide. It doesn't mean you're sitting at Lewis Clark Road in 101 for two hours. It means that for a two hour period, things are going to be a lot slower and you're probably going to sit through a couple lights. Yes. As opposed to you yeah, waited at Broadway for three really hours to cross the road. We pulled this straight out of their, um, their documents. Yeah. So yeah, it's right. not fully. That's a great observation, though, because if people <laughs> yes. were thinking that, that would be a problem. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we, would, we would acknowledge we think, that that's a big problem. acceptable yeah. to sit for three hours at Beaver Creek Road while the school's getting out. No, 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 that is <laughs> not. You know, if that's, this was weekdays or it was a weekend. Weekends are entirely different on Highway 101. Yes. Yeah. So, it's is this average an average? Annu average annual. Okay. Yeah. yeah Which that. means that on the 4th of July, yeah. You're going to sit a little longer than that. Might even Clark be three shows. hours on the 4th of July. That means there's going to be some enterprising entrepreneur that's going to put up a food cart and run up and down the highway selling <laughs> food for three hours so that uh, they can make a little money. Yeah, yeah that's the, I mean, I saw that and I thought that, that needs to be clarified. That's yeah. Okay, so a um, couple more things. There was a concern that we weren't going to meet ADA requirements with any changes, and I can just assure you that... Um, Every project that we're working on requires ADA improvements and we'll have funding, and funding was included in our estimates for ADA improvements. Um, I'm just gonna, let's see, what was the other one? TriMet service, why can't we improve transit service in the area or connect light rail down here? Um, well, the light rail issue is quite a ways off. I wouldn't even try to show that in any kind of scenario, but um, TriMet, is already planning on making service adjustments um, with the transit center at the community college. With the Myers Road connection, I, I, I'm just going to assure you that TriMet is going to work with us on route changes to adjust as the needs arise. So I don't think that there's an issue there um, with TriMet. Are they, do they need to do it today? Probably not. Um, 
we still have the option to retain the full interchange. I think, you know, we redo our transportation system plan every 10 years, and I'm looking so forward to the next transportation system plan redo and that whole community involvement process. But when that comes up, you know, we'll always be looking at these standards, and if we're missing them, the state, you know, regionally especially, they're looking at changing the standards by which we measure intersection congestion in the region right now. Uh, we're not the only across the state. We're not the only ones dealing with this. We're just the ones who happen to be kind of first at this. So just know we'll keep looking at that. And um, with regard to freight impact, uh, will accepting higher congestion at this intersection hurt freight movement? And uh, the common is, or our response is, Peak freight movement occurs between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. The interchange operations are acceptable during these hours. The proposal to change the mobility standard only applies to the peak hour, which is uh, 3 to 6. Um, so I agree with that. Obviously, there's trucks that use it during the peak hours as well. And yeah, it will impact those. Um, from ODOT's perspective, though, they're pretty focused on those other, those other business hours as opposed to the morning and afternoon. So. I think that's it. Sorry if that took too long. No, I, um, just to, to clarify, so we're the first in the metro region to use this because obviously it appears that Seaside already is there, but they're not in the re in the metro region. Right, they're, so, I feel like they're region two or right, region one. one. Right, so that probably needs to be clarified just slightly. So just to reminder, you know, we're, we're asking you to, uh, the Planning Commission recommend approval of L1703 and forward to the city commission. What is it you're asking us to recommend, though? Now, after all of this has gone through, we've heard lots of different pictures and designs. Well, what we're really being asked to do is accept a VOC of 1.0 over three hours is essentially what it all comes down to. We're not, we're not uh, accepting uh, you know, there will be an interchange or a diamond or the weird left turn thing. None of that. It's that there's going to there. You're going to make you're going to make the the run out merge. You're going to look at killing the the double turn lane, and we're going to have three hours of congestion. And we're going to approve Seaside's plan. <laughs> <laughs> Only if we get the same views. So, so the actual legislative amendment that we're that the city is asking for uh, a recommendation of approval for is to amend that chapter 12 of our code to change the mobility standard to 1.0 for three hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, to amend the transportation system plan project list with these four projects. Okay. Just to clarify, S13, mm -hmm. that's that windy bike path where you're moving it off a of holly lane to a windy bike path. Just as a quick summary, because that's a lot of words that don't mean anything necessarily. Yes. OK. Thank you. And just to add a little bit more to that, so in general, we know that we don't have $50 million. Nobody's giving us $50 million. And so we're creating the solution. The solution includes capacity improvements, but it also includes safety improvements. So we're looking at that package tied with the rest of our transportation system plan, which provides alternate mobility of ways to get around with like Myers Road and things like that as well. Um, and then what it is today is 0.99 for two hours. So we're looking at going from 0.99 to 1.0 for three hours. So for that, that minimal change with um, acceptable congestion, um, you get this trade-off of improvements, and those improvements will then go on to lists so we can get um, money from development. When they start to do that, they can do their proportional share of impacts. Um, right now, like this turn lane is not on any list, so we cannot collect any proportional share of it. And um, the reason why we're doing all this in the first place is because we have to, and we have to identify solutions that are feasible. and. The fifty million dollars just isn't feasible at this point. So I get that it's a it's a tough project to do, but there aren't a whole lot of alternatives. Um, Any questions, or do you want to hold them until after public comment? Well, I do have one kind of quick question: the erasure of the second turn lane to create a longer queuing lane for Maple Lane. 
Um, you said you want to hold off until you can make general improvements to the Maple Lane interchange, which I can kind of understand, but um, I almost think we might want to look at doing at least that Q Lane sooner rather than later so that we start training the regular <laughs> yeah, commuters and also to acknowledge the, the problems that are happening at Maple Lane. I mean, we may not get $3 million for a, a signalization fix or whatever, but shifting a cement barrier, I mean, it's not as simple as that, I understand, but still, um, could create, I think, um, you know, a, I think we need to get people trained to do that. And so maybe it's a summer project so the school kids learn it before they're commuting or whatever, but I think it needs to be a sooner rather than later project. And was there anything, I don't, I never saw anything at all about smart lights, you know, like. Signalization upgrades yeah. and smart, yeah, uh, all that ITS. All that, we're going to eke out all the efficiencies that we can through those kind of measures as well. There's still the projects that are listed in the TSP that we, you know, with the reader board that kind of says congestion ahead. And I think the other thing I'd mention is the section that you're talking about where that turn lane pocket would be mm -hmm. is, um, that's a county road, and if you've driven it lately, it's it's ready for some pavement enhancements, so we're going to start bending the county's ear on that, and I think that's the right time to make that adjustment. Yeah. I just don't want it to get lost because it, it does seem like a simple, elegant solution rather than an expensive, elegant solution. Yeah. So, okay. Any questions at this time? Okay, let's get to the public testimony and we can have our questions later. Uh, I'm going to call Paul and Jim up at the same time, please. Thank you, Commission. I'm Paul Edgar. I live in Oregon City. I was on the Clackamas County Transportation Advisory Committee doing their TSP in, through 2010, uh, uh, up to 13. And Beaver Creek Road at that intersection was at level of service F failing during all that time. And so what we're really talking about is that it's been failing and we've been doing a little Mickey Mouse changes around trying to make it better. And, and we honestly have done good, uh, made some nice things, improvements, but it's still failing. So now we're gonna use volume over capacity and alternative mobility targets to allow us to build, to allow more congestion. And that's simply what it, what we're doing. We're not really saying that it's doing going to be anything other than a failing intersection, but we now have a new way to calculate failure. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I my problem is is I, there's a reality test here for everyone. We don't know that it's fifty million dollars to put to the type of overpass that should go over the top of two thirteen. But one thing is for sure, that if we don't have it on the books as a long, long, it should be S14. It should still be there listed. And we should be allocating the properties and, 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 and the right of ways necessary now when we can do it, rather than after it's all developed and we can't. And then it, then it costs 100 million. So my, my thought process here is, is that of, a, of, of saying, why don't we just face the fact that we know that we've got a failing intersection and at least plan for the future with something that we know is going to be needed and there's really not any alternative for it. We're doing everything we can. Congratulations to everybody doing what they can. But I'm telling you, this method of effort of doing volume over capacity with alternative mobility targets where I can take it, take one number out of three hours and then average it over the year is just a method to cheat, to fudge the, the facts. Yeah, it's legal. But that also points down, comes back to the bureaucracy and, and the loss of faith 
that we're continuously seeing in government and bureaucracy and planning and all of this stuff. And there's a price to pay. And I don't like the price that we're paying because we're cheating and we're fibbing to the public about what reality truly is. So, but thank you very much for allowing me to get it off my chest. Good. Thank you, Paul. Hi, I'm James Nasita. I live at 302 Bluff Street here in Oregon City. Uh, I have two comments I want to make. First is I, I would like to take polite issue with uh, what Ms. Reed said about um, uh, the fish passage issue. Um, she seemed to be indicating that uh, we have a natural resources overlay zone and you know we'll deal with it when we have to deal with uh, any specific project and we'll just apply our natural resources overlay code. I think that's chapter 17.49. Um, I want to alert the Planning Commission to the fact that you've already lost that case. Um, you may recall I appealed the bus barn zone change to Luba, and the point I won on that got that case remanded back to this commission was exactly on the argument that Ms. Reed just made. They, Luba held in that case, in its remand, that the city has to undertake an initial inquiry as to whether they have whether um, your um, goal five uh, plan and analysis is sufficient um, at the level of, of a legislative amendment like a zone change. So that's what's going on here. Um, and in this case, not only do you have uh, the spillover from the pipe that the pictures were showing, you also have the added lane. Um, you know the lane from. Beaver Creek down to 13, which is going to expand, and it's going to expand into that uh, little stretch of, of Newell Creek, which is a, um, in fact, a uh, designated or a listed Goal 5 resource area. So I, I'm, I have to tell you that, that that's not correct. You, um, you have to deal with Goal 5 during this legislative amendment, and uh, it sounds from like what Ms. Reed was just saying that that has not happened. Um, the second point is a broader point. Um, I'd like the commission maybe to go from focusing narrowly on what's before you right now to take a look at the really, really, really big picture. I think this whole alternative mobility standards um, represents an abdication of the entire Oregon land use planning system. I'm really, um, it's really tragic to me that both the state and metro um, um, enabled and authorized these uh, um, alternative mobility standards, which is basically saying we accept more congestion and more growth, and we're not going to, you know, apply the goals like the you know the state transportation rule and all the all the, and the 2040 growth concept plan and everything that our metropolitan land use system is based on to keep us from you know mowing down farmland, et cetera, and you know, we were supposed to grow denser and smarter, so we didn't have to have these issues. And all of this, to me, these AMTs are just a way of saying we give up, and I don't want to give up. That's why I moved to Oregon in the first place. Um, um, and you know, e even though you know, the AMT was adopted in 2013 in the uh, transportation system plan, I'm wondering if we can take you know, a bird's eye view of all this and say what we're doing here is kind of madness. It's nuts. Why are we doing this? And can we just exercise the option not to do this? Let's grow smart. Let's densify downtown. Let's, you know, do a special transportation area in Kanema and make it, you know, a walkable city, you know, very historic downtown, little village downtown. You know, let's have apartment apartments on the north end of Main Street rather than, you know, you know, automobile deal dealerships. There's a lot of room for growth in Oregon City without resorting to abdication of the values that we as Oregonians hold dear. And it might take courage, but I would urge this commission to take a big view and say, we're going down the wrong path here. Let's turn around. Let's not fall off the cliff. Um, let's stand up for Oregon City and our livability. And let's, let's just say no to AMT. Let's grow differently, let's grow smarter, and uh, you know, don't abdicate. Thanks. William?
Madam Chair, Commissioners. My name is William Gifford. I live in Oregon City. I was struck by something Ms. Turway blurted out, that there are not a lot of options. And it's really true, there aren't a lot of options. The one option that you can't do is nothing. You can't do nothing. This intersection is failing now. It's destined to be a lot worse. It's a failed situation that needs to be remedied. And I partially agree with Mr. Edgar. Just want to get that on the record. <laughs> we need to do something for the future. If we don't get this on the books, we're not going to have a hope. We have to do something. And I would encourage you not to skirt the issue, but adopt the plan that staff is projecting here. It's not perfect. It's not going to please everybody. But it will be taking a step in the right direction of getting something done. Get off the dime. Doug? Just real quick before Doug comes up. John, we're still leaving the full interchange in our plan, right? I thought you said that we were, it was still just going to sit there as an unfunded. No. Okay, if anybody else wants to testify on this issue, please no, the come full get your slips in so they're not just okay. dribbling it be in <laughs> all night. Yes, sir, proceed. Please. Yeah, Doug Neely, I, I dribbled in because I wanted to respond to one of the other people that didn't dribble in. Good. Uh, the, uh, Come on up. The, uh, the, the thing I wanted to bring forward was this. First of all, goal five issues are extremely important. I don't want to belittle that. Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife does not believe that any fish have been able to go up uh, the upper part of No Creek Canyon simply because the slope gradient is won't permit it, and he introduced that subject in terms of fish passage. There would be no anatomous uh, fish going up there, and that's just that's that's the nature of the creek. But that doesn't belittle the fact that we need to be concerned in terms of stormwater issues and everything else of the impact downstream. And uh, I think Public Works has been doing a great job in trying to re uh, refit some of the areas that we've had problems with. Thank you. Thanks, Dad. Hey, Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Mitchell. I'm an Oregon City resident, and I was on the community advisory group uh, for this project. And uh, I guess I'd start by saying that I, I don't think anybody on that group was exactly thrilled with this recommendation. Um, but as Laura has said and William uh, reemphasized, we have to do something. Something that hasn't come up tonight that was explained to us by ODOT less than 50 percent excuse me more than 50 percent of the trips through that intersection do not originate or end in oregon city so we can sit back and do nothing and the intersection is going to continue to fail we can't control what happens in the hamlet of beaver creek or what happens in malala all that traffic's still going to come through here if we don't get our ore in the water here and say here's the short-term things we want to do and Mr. Edgar, don't let this go to your head, but I'm going to agree with you also. <laughs> we need to, in whatever manner we can, keep pushing for that longer-term fix. But to me, if we don't do this now, it's a lose-lose. We're still going to work with a progressively failing intersection, and we're not going to have the opportunity to do some of the things that we need to do in Oregon City uh, to bring more jobs to the Beaver Creek industrial area, to bring more jobs to the Beaver Creek concept plan area, and, and we're just going to have the worst of both worlds. So I would encourage you to go forward with this and keep pushing on the bigger solution as well. Thank you. Kent? Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, thank you for allowing me to um, comment tonight. I appreciate uh, all the testimony and information that's been provided by uh, John Lewis of Public Works and Kelly as planner. We've been following quick, a lot of the... To, Ken, you need to state your name for the oh, record. Kent Ziegler. Um, I've been following one of my board members for the Oregon City Business Alliance is participating as a representative on the Alternative Mobility Standard Task Force. 
And obviously, I agree with what William Gifford and Paul Edgar and others, uh, Mike Mitchell, have shared. You need to start somewhere. It is important. We all recognize that this is a, a very critical intersection for a lot of the future employment opportunities in Oregon City. I co-chair with Renata Megalbird, uh, one of the city commissioners, the Beaver Creek Employment Lands. And one of the critical infrastructure items to allow those jobs to be created is for this transportation issue to be addressed. And again, as, I, as we've heard from a lot of other people, this is not the end all. This is just the beginning. Um, I attended the Clackamas County Business Alliance board meeting a little over a week ago where Tom Hughes, uh, president of Metro, was a speaker. And we brought up to him at that meeting this particular situation because over 50%, as was mentioned earlier, of the traffic that is utilizing this intersection is generated outside of Oregon City. And so we need to now start talking to our other partners that would be a part of this infrastructure improvement. Tom Hughes made the comment, well, Oregon City hasn't contacted me. I'd love to hear from Oregon City about participating in this infrastructure improvement, but someone from the city needs to reach out and have that dialogue with us. So I just would request that someone here from the city would start that dialogue. Tomorrow at my Oregon City Business Alliance Forum, we do them every month, our speakers are the Clackamas County Economic Development Commission. We're gonna be bringing up with them transportation issues. We're gonna be bringing up with them employment issues. We're gonna be bringing up with them where, where all this works together with the city and the county. I would request that any one of you on the Planning Commission come to our forum tomorrow. It starts at 11.30 at the Abernathy Center and come with questions. Ask these people, what do you have in your budget that could help pay for this infrastructure improvement since it's a county issue when traffic's being generated in Molala, Mulino, and elsewhere, and not just Oregon City. So again, as others have stated, I just agree with their comments. You need to start somewhere, but I also implore you to start that dialogue with the other partners, because I think it's a win-win if we all share together. Thank you for your time. Before I call uh, Lynn Anderson up, let me just make a quick comment that uh, the city didn't just fall off the turnip truck. The city has been talking about this project since before I moved here. And when 213 opened, it has unfortunately fallen on deaf ears. So I am aware of that for a fact that this has been going on. I've lived here since 1988, and that dialogue's been going on prior to that. So the city is not at fault in any way about not talking about this issue. They have been talking about it till they are blue in the face. <laughs> and nobody's totally recognizing what the real situation is, which again, as people have already said, it's pro uh, traffic that's being generated outside our community. So you know, what I didn't see in here, John, is we don't have a provision for tolling. <laughs> yeah. Lynn, come on up. That's my solution. Value of pricing. Yeah. Free yes. pricing. Hi, Lynn Anderson, Oregon City. Um, good comments. The one thing I felt I was kind of brushed over and I didn't hear a lot about was safety. And time after time, I've witnessed citizens testify their concerns for the traffic and the safety of our roads and our intersections. And their testimony is always based on their personal experience on a daily <laughs> basis. And these are concerns our safety, for safety are supported by our own police force who's talked before about stated number of crashes at this intersection, that they're amongst the highest in the area. But then we have, and this is my fear, if we just pass this and hope that everything's gonna work out, my fear is that what I've seen in the past is that after the citizens comment about their concerns about safety, that the uh, developers paid traffic engineers come before you guys and after they've spent a day or two on the sub on this subject they testify the total opposite opinion of what the perception is of the people who live here and experience it every day um, an attorney for one of the developments I, I remember told you all of you on the commission that it doesn't matter if a thousand citizens sit up here and tell you about their concerns about the safety of these intersections it doesn't matter as long as the criteria has been met 
you must approve it. And you know what, he's right. Um, the fix is in and it's weighted in the side of the development, the, not to the citizens. And finally though, the numbers are telling us what the citizens have been saying for years. For once, the paid traffic engineers, they can't refute these numbers, this VC ratio. Um, so what do they want us to do? Change the numbers. So I just feel like if you allow this, the safety of our roads and the intersections, so they're, they're only going to get worse, that if this is approved, there's gonna be more traffic, more, more safety issues, more cars, and that we're just gonna keep kicking this can down the road, that we need to force our city, our county, our state, our metro to come to the table and to take real action to improve our safety. And I just didn't hear enough talk I felt tonight about the safety concerns in that intersection. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, this is last call on this one. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and ask for the Planning Commission's questions and deliberation. Well, I, to a certain extent, um, and this is being a devil's advocate, maybe we shouldn't do anything, let it fail so bad that the people in Moala have to spend three hours trying to get through the intersection, that Metro can't get anybody to come to the county to, to develop it because they can't build in our industrial lands and make it so bad that we force them to the table with bags of money in hand to fix the problem as opposed to just keep rubbing butter on the rails and hope that we can keep squeezing the fat man through, uh, me being the fat man. Um, so I, 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 I can devil's advocate that side of it. I completely, you know, I mean, when I was in the military and we needed a really bad fix on the ship and we couldn't get the funding, we let the ship rot. And boy, you know, it's amazing when you can't get a carrier underway because, you know, something doesn't work, money just falls out of the sky. It's just, a, it's, it's crazy. Um, so, I'm, I'm really tempted to go with that. Um, but then my ego steps in and I say, you know, I was the guy who said, hey, why don't we do that little merge runout lane and why don't we move that, get rid of that second turn lane and have more queuing for Maple. And so my ego says, hey, those are my projects and I want them to happen. <laughs> so, um, and, I, and I think, frankly, those, if we can do something with, with the Maple and we get this runout lane, I think, you know, and the numbers tend to bear it out that large portions of the, the queuing issues are going to disappear, especially if we can do something like uh, getting smarter uh, inter uh, signalization. Um, it's uh, yeah. the other side of it is the development will force that. You know, you get, and I'm just going to paint it, Intel decides to build a chip plant because the high school and the college are there. And then they go to the governor and say, you know, we can get a project or a product to, to market. The governor's gonna listen. You know, Oregon State Transportation is gonna listen when somebody says, you know, you, you have crushed our business if you don't fix this. What I would like to see, and I thought it was already there, is that the interchange stays sitting in an unfunded liability, but it's a project number so that um, we can you know, take like 1% or something and just set it aside to create those matching funds that we say, there's an opportunity to strike. We have money right now, you have money. A um, couple of our major projects have happened because there's been, you know, an ability to do that. Um, and, you know, if down the road we decide we're not gonna do it, it's not gonna happen, the VOC works, hey, we've got a small pot of money to fix something else somewhere in the city, so. Uh, so that would be my only recommendation is that we put the interchange back in the system so that it's something we can point at and try to fund. Other than that, I'm good with the, uh, the other changes. Infill creates congestion. And whether or not the infill is starting from the outside in, um, Mr. Nasita's comments about, you know, we need to start in the center and work out are great, but that just means I'm sitting at 7th and Washington longer. I'm still dealing with congestion. So, you know, spread the pain. Maybe we can spread the cost. <laughs> so, that's it. 
that's it. I'm not sure I understood that. Mr. Mahoney? Well, everybody's right, <laughs> and nobody's right. <laughs> it all boils down to money, and we all know it. And we don't have a mechanism by which to head down to where the money initiates, and that's the state of Oregon. They've refused, on the face of it, to recognize that this is a state problem. And everybody in this room recognizes that this is, or well, the problem exists because of traffic being generated outside of Oregon City, and Oregon City is being asked to, to solve a, a regional problem. I come down on the, on the uh, side of public safety Whatever we do, we, we, uh, the changes that we're going to make are going to improve the uh, safety factor up there. <clears throat> we're going to kick this down the road, not because we want to, because we, we find ourselves in, in a situation where we almost, I don't like to say the word have to, but that's, that's what we're doing. And then we're doing it for the sake of, of uh, changing standards so that we can qualify for some financial aid and um, roll the dice, so to speak, that we're going to uh, solve this further on down, down the road. I'm going to support it because I think that, I think that we've got it. I, uh, Jim Nacita made, uh, made a uh, comment here about advocating our responsibility on a metro level. Well, I don't want to advocate my responsibility on a local level by ignoring uh, public safety standards. I don't think the improvement of highways comes from making uh, physical improvements as much as uh, uh, making smart highways. We're heading in the direction of making smart cars now. They're almost a rolling computer, for God's sakes. Same thing with highways. We're going to make those, those things uh, uh, function a little bit more efficiently. Um, I could s sit here all night and babble. I think we all could. You know, we've all done it. Um, we've got planning, we've got legal, now we've got money. We can do it with the first two, the planning and the legal. We've got the trained professionals to help us out. Where the money comes from, that's a political issue. And that comes from the leadership, both at the city commission, the county, board of county commissioners, metro, and the state. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to support this, and then I'll just I'll just let it move on from here. Go to Vern. Vern. Yeah, we. I, I'm going to simplify it, and, and it really revolves around what we have and what we want. We we have plenty of con traffic congestion, and what we want and need is some source of funding to help us pay for that. And the, the thing that we've heard here for the last couple of weeks is one of the sources is of the money can be SDCs, which has a little conflict to it in that SDCs require more development, which creates more traffic. So we get in this vicious cycle and we're trying to say, or I'm thinking, how do we break out of this cycle? You know, do we put our blinders on and just say, hey, it's going to, let's see what happens. Let's, let's put a five-year period on it and say, let's not do anything and wait for five years. It's not going to be better in five years. So with, with that cycle to break out, I think... We need to support this, get it into the programs and plans to have people start looking for it. It's not going to solve everything, but it's, as some people have said, it's a start. So that's my look at it and probably will support this program. Tom? I appreciate your comments down at that end, both of you. And what Len was talking about, one thing I know, I come through that a lot because my storage units are up that way for my store. 
I have a concern about traffic safety. I know there's lots of accidents up there, I see that. But also, the people who walk down the sidewalk there and then they cross over to the median to cross over 213, you're gonna get people in their cars who are gonna get used to the fact that they can just now all of a sudden go quickly down there and down the hill and without stopping and looking for pedestrians that are standing on that corner trying to cross over. So that's gonna be something that's gonna, if this passes, it's gonna to need to be um, seriously thought about, all those pedestrians other than just cars that come through that area. Um, I understand what, what you're saying. I understand what everybody's saying. But, you know, my conscience still is the fact that Redland was not included on this. And um, I, I'm disappointed that it's not there. I agree that Beaver Creek needs some functioning, something better. Um, as I said, I come through there a lot. But uh, my conscience tells me that I'm still disappointed that uh, Redland Road and the fix there is not. I know it's money, but I know it's not there, and I know it's going to get worse. And anybody who doesn't live out there doesn't understand that. And that's my comments. Well, I don't have any comments yet, but I, I guess one of the things I noted when I read it the first time and then I reread it is um, why haven't we done an ESEE on the goal five? To me, the findings in this report are not adequate. It's not really addressing it. We can't kick that can down the road. It has to be addressed in order, in my opinion, in order for it to be meeting the goal five standard. And what we have here is a good start, but it doesn't address it. ESEE. Environmental social, economic, it's part of the goal five resource. I understand, yes. but you just used yes. an acronym. Yes, I so. did. So <laughs> where, where is our analysis that's part of this as the finding? Oh, that's Sorry, you. it's it's Paul. I'm not going to answer it, but. Denise, would you like me to respond to that? Please, yeah. Um, so there are two kind of places in the staff report where we have findings. Uh, we have findings for our Goal 5 comprehensive plan, and then for statewide planning goal 5. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a good paragraph under the statewide planning goal 5 that um, kind of s does a good job of making those findings. Uh, and I think that it might make sense to take another look at that and um, add some more information there, especially to our the other, the comp our comprehensive plan goal five section that doesn't have that same paragraph in it. Uh, and so I think staff can look at that and um, and make some changes. Uh, you know, if, if this is, if, if there's a recommendation for approval today, we um, would be going to city commission next in March. Uh, and then we can make that revision to the staff report um, in between now and the I city think commission I would like meeting. to see it. Um, I, I'm trying to find the paragraph that you're talking about that, that addresses it. I'm not, I'm not trying to stall this, but if we are saying that it meets the comprehensive plan, then it needs to meet the comprehensive plan and it needs to meet the statewide planning goals. And I read the watershed report that came along with this, and it's just, you know, there's a whole bunch of information in that that we're not, so we're, which paragraph is it? I'm, I'm looking on, on page, uh, let's see, what page are we on here? Statewide planning goal five is on page 21 of the staff report. Okay, I'm looking at page 13 as well where you start, mm -hmm. the analysis is started there and it says findings as complies as proposed. Yeah, so I think what we might want to do is make sure that both the page 13 and then page 21 kind of have this both address the same and I think right now they're slightly different and so yeah they are we have it in um, we have it on page 21 uh, for goal statewide planning goal five mm -hmm. so the analysis is, is attached as part of this report as a supplemental information the findings are listed in the staff report there is no attached analysis okay well it seems to me in order to make the finding you have to have the analysis to make that, to make these statements. So that what I'm asking is, where is the analysis? The Greater Oregon City Watershed Council has um, some information, I believe, in the record. Mm -hmm. I think is that we utilize. I think she's referring to the Metro ESEE analysis that's referenced in this. Mm -hmm. It's referenced. Yeah, it's referenced in there. Yeah. And you know, we could. We could I just attach it, it to the record. I think it just needs to be beefed up some more. It, mm -hmm. it really doesn't. 
you know, again, it really doesn't get to the issue. It's kind of like, well, we're maybe going to kind of, kind of going to do this. And I don't think we want to maybe kind of do it. I think we want to either say we're going to do it and say that it complies and we want to have the documentation that backs it up. What, I, what I'm mostly concerned about this is, like I said earlier, is that the city has been talking about this for ever. And what concerns me is kind of what Damon said. This is, he didn't say in these words, but to me, this is a big fat Band-Aid. So what happens when we rip it off? You know, we've been, we've been ripping the Band-Aid off. I mean, I recall um, this, the county and the city saying at the time 213 open, we're already at a level of service F. So how many years has it been since, the, since, the, since it opened? I'm not entirely convinced that doing something, anything, something is really going to solve the problem. And we, again, I'm, I'm, and again, it has to do with my history here. We are continuing to kick this can down the road. We've been kicking it and kicking it and kicking it. I think our feet are getting tired from kicking the can. I just, I'm frustrated from the standpoint that we've come up with something it's not bad. It's not bad at all. But does it really get to where we really need to be? And Mike is saying, well, we need to keep pressing and pressing. I mean, how much more do we need to be pressing when we've been saying this for over 25 and 30 years? It just, the, it, the, the frustration. It gets down to the question is, does this challenge the integrity of this city's planning program. It's been challenging the integrity yeah. of the city's planning program since the darn thing opened. Yeah. We have, I mean, we, we have not, you know, made any progress. And I, you know, I had hoped that we had been setting aside money all this time to do this rather than saying, which is what I kind of see what we've done, you know, again, past administrations, we don't have the money, so we can't do anything. Denise, so what do we, <laughs> what do we do? I have a question of a legal nature, if you don't mind. Sure, go right uh, ahead. William, uh, now, the question has probably already been answered, but for the record, just indulge me. This is a state highway, right? Correct. And it's a county highway. That's county my understanding okay. as well, yeah. Now, one of, do the we, legs. one of the legs. Yes. Yeah, okay. Do we have the legal jurisdiction to be making this decision? Yes. You know, um, we, you've got, as you know, one of the goals is required coordination with different affected agencies. But we have the planning authority. It is within Oregon City. We have the planning authority to, to decide what happens here in, in cooperation with, with the other agencies. This is our jurisdiction. So, you know, I, I have, I have little doubt that we have the, the authority to make a decision, you know, um, adopting these standards. And we've, you know, obviously coordinated with uh, ODOT and the county and, you know, they, you know, ODOT is fully in support. Um, I can't recall exactly where the county is, um, but they're certainly they haven't objected. Have yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. No, at no, the end of the day, we, nobody has- Are we making a recommendation to the state? The state's actually adopting the standard. You're right. It is. Uh, yes, so it's a they, recommendation they make, to the state. Make the, the, you make the decision here at the Planning Commission, a recommendation. That goes before the City Commission, right? Yes. They, they adopt it. And then that gets handed to ODA. And they, they, take it before, it. they take it before the Oregon Transportation Station Commission. Commission. You. And, you know, they, they've been paying close attention, uh, you know, participating because they wanted to make sure we went through a public open process and that this community came to that decision. So I, I don't think without a recommendation from the city, the state's going to do anything. No. They're no, just going to say no. no more development. And if that's what you want to say, I think no, that's say, what, I didn't catch that. Dick, but. The state's, if the, if the city says, you know, we don't want to ex accept this kind of a standard, then they're going to say, okay, just no, you, that's okay for you. But with that, it means no zone changes. No zone changes. Any zone changes that impact this intersection, which could mean, which means, I think, for Oregon City, no employment in that Beaver Creek concept area. That's the, that's the downside. 
So w what decision or recommendation you're making to the city commission, they will then make a recommendation to the state and the state will take it forward. You ever see the movie Catch-22? <laughs> yeah, I've been there. Yeah. That's, what this, that's what it boils down to. And Commissioner Mahoney, I might also add an additional gloss on it, that we have an obligation under the planning goals to come up with a solution. You know, is there, and the reality is, we can't fix it. We don't have the money, and a significant part of the problem is not ours. You know, it's, it's coming from elsewhere in the county. The question you need to ask yourself as you do it is, is this, does this make it better? You know, even for an interim period, while we continue hopefully to, to work on something that, that does fix it. And, you know, and, and that's, that's what you and, and the city commission have to look at is, you know, is this, acceptable does it get it further down the road or are, are we just at the point now where we're going to dig in our heels and you know uh, not and say as as commissioner maybe suggested the way to get it done is to you know not do anything and, and wait for somebody else to fix it but the other fix is to wait another minute through a uh, light uh, signal uh, change and call that the fix an extra uh, an extra minute Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't have so much of a problem if we were looking at it from a standpoint of it was getting more employment. It's everything else that comes with it that we don't have the capacity to deal with right now. The employment is one thing. I can separate those two things in my mind. I can separate the need for employment. I'm not sure we need all the other stuff that comes with our plans that we have. We, we don't have the capacity to deal with that. The employment, yes. I mean, we can use the jobs. We can fix that, then the other stuff will follow. But it doesn't come that way. We can't split the baby. So. But on the other side, we're assuming, and this is dangerous, we're we assuming what that the money is never going to be there. Oh, I'm assuming it's, it's never going to be it there. It might be there. I'm assuming it's never going to be there. I mean, 10 years down the, uh, down the line, it just, it's going to be more expensive, but they'll cough up $75 million and fix this like they did the junk handle. Well, I don't think this is going to rise to the level of the Highway 217. Otherwise, it would have been fixed already. Yeah. But I, I guess well, I'm, I mean, trying I... to, I'm trying to hold my nose <laughs> and say, is this the best we can do? My gut tells me it probably is at this time, but, but I'm, I'm very uneasy about it because, again, it's a Band-Aid. Well, We've been band-aiding this thing, and I guess I'm at the point now where the only way I could recommend approval is if we can come back in two weeks with the beefed-up findings, I will feel better about it. I, I don't want to send this to the City Commission as a recommendation with some of the findings and statements the way they are. I think they need a little more robustness to them. I think it needs to be really, really clear, uh, some of the comments that the public made. Somehow or another, we need to get some of that in, not in the findings, but, you know, I think the people that have testified, the ones that are looking at this with, I will say, and I mean this in the most politest way, with a jaundice eye, are looking at it, trying to say, okay, here's the alternative. Where do we, what do we get for this? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure what we'll, you know, we're going to totally get from this. We're going to get some minimal improvements, like you say, they're going to last for that long, and then we're going to be right back, you know, some other planning commission is going to be right back here where we are. Again, John, you're going to be retired. I'm going to be retired. We're all going to be retired. Somebody else is going to be dealing with this, and they're going to say, why didn't they do anything about this back in 2000, fill in the blank? Well, they tried. Um, Denise, and I agree that we, we're trying. Yeah. Um, you said that you don't see this ever rising to the level of 217, and I guess my answer to that is, the reason why 217 happened, the reason why Sunnyside happened, they have more is cloud be, than we do. And the reason why they have more cloud is because they have more businesses. As long as we're trying to fix a problem dealing with farmland. Yeah. Or residential, the, which well, isn't going to cut it. I mean, it, it, it's still farmland. I mean, it's big, wide open, empty spaces. The state and is not going to even look at coming up with any money. But when, like I said, Intel or Freightliner, or 
you know, any of these people that are responsible for bringing commerce to the state say, you're screwing us, you need to fix that. I agree. Then things are going to happen. All right, we don't have so. any of that. Yeah, we don't have But in defense of the Planning Commission and the people out there that are offered their testimony, we have approached this in good faith. We've made the best effort that we can, given the information that we, we can. Have. And knowing what the history of this, we've approached it in good faith. Now, the uh, improvements that we're proposing here aren't ideal, and we understand that. And we're frustrated by it. But to do nothing, as Mike Mitchell said, to do nothing is, is, is just that, to do nothing. And I think William Gifford said the same thing. We've got to do something. We can't abdicate our responsibility, even, even though I still think it's the states, but we do have a responsibility to do something. I just want to be, I want to be certain that it's the right something. Because doing something for something's sake doesn't do anything. Well, I'm not infallible. I don't think this commission is. No, I don't think we are so either. We'll so we'll take the information that's right. been given us. So like I said, and, I'm, and I'm willing with. to hold my nose because I think the staff has done the best job that they possibly can under the circumstances and knowing, you know, and again, I'm assuming you know the whole history of this So, so I just, road, I just want to remind you, I mean, we heard about safety concerns. We didn't <laughs> talk about safety here, right. but we've got a lot of ideas about safety in, in this plan, right? Can we've we heard add? about, we've heard about pedestrian concerns and in, you know, don't, don't think of what you have today. Think of what you could have with a project that's going to have to probably touch all the ADA ramps. It's going to probably have to, you know, the signalization of the crossing there that, um, Commissioner Guile mentioned, those things will come along with the project that we've got listed. We've also got the other projects that are the um, safety projects along 213, right? The, the um, advanced warning, which is really, I get it. A lot of people don't like those advanced warning systems. They don't necessarily save you any time, but they give you information on congestion that's coming around the corner, right? Those kinds of things are gonna make that intersection better. The trail improvements that we've already gotten a TSP, the city commission has been bold. Uh, you know, the action that they took on Wednesday night with the SDC increases was a tough, tough decision for them, right? That, that was a big increase and it still keeps our commercial SDCs at a pretty high rate. So. You know, it's not like we're, um, these are money issues, but you know, our city commission's been um, strong on making those kind of decisions and they're hard to ask for. So, you know, it's hard to bring that kind of stuff before the commission. There's a bunch of people um, that didn't want to see those kind of rate increases oh, go forward. Imagine. So, and you know, this uh, free flowing right turn lane is gonna make a big difference and yeah, it's, it's, and I guess I will just add this. I use that intersection too. I live in this town just as much, and I drive through that intersection just as much as all of you do. Probably it's not, not that <laughs> bad. I, I just don't drive It's it. not that bad when compared to other regional problems across the state. I do have a problem with the safety problem that, that I heard on the news with third worst intersection in the state. We can fix that. I think we can lean heavily on the state to Yes, it's a thoroughfare. Yes, it's a expressway. But you know what? That speed limit through Oregon City maybe needs to drop. And, you know, find ways to, you know, they're going to tell you, oh, it's based on how fast people really feel comfortable driving it. That's what they're going to say. Well, maybe we need to, you know, work on improvements that, you know, calm traffic a little bit. What Share with mean? them the uh, fact that they got a safety I don't disagree with you. There. I don't disagree so, with you. This is, my comments are not a criticism of know, you and, know, and your work. My criticism comes from, from many, many years of hearing this story over and over and over again. You know, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard this story, I could so, take, you, take you on a nice trip to Hawaii. So, so to that's kind of where I'm coming from. Forward, um, I agree with Denise needing to see the EC analysis. I mean, we had a very, very direct comment that, you know, we didn't we didn't deal with goal five like we're supposed to in this document, and it could cause problems. I don't want it to cause problems. Right. That's so, why. Um, I think. Before you make any motion, can we just? I wasn't going to make motion. I just agree. Oh, okay. He's coming. Yeah. Go ahead. I did want to say that 
what I did, what I I did not hear that an EC analysis was required. What I heard was there must be more of an initial inquiry based on that the historic properties case. And what I can tell you is that we will take a look at that case and make sure that we address that concern. It, it may not be an EC analysis. Well, it says in there that there is an EC analysis already. There's a Metro EC analysis. And, and that's we'll, we as will, it applies. Yeah. yeah we need to we just want to make sure that you're not saying right. go back and do an EC analysis. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that if we're saying that it's been done, it needs to be incorporated into this yep. and also called out as an attachment that the work has been done. Because again, while I'm holding my nose, I don't want this to be challenged. And if we don't you know, you're, you're asking us for our eyes to take a look. What, what do we see that might be missing or what do we need to beef up? That is my biggest concern. I don't want this to be appealed. I don't want to see this again. <laughs> Not for personal reasons or, or planning commission reasons. I think we, you know, we just need to beef this up some more, make sure we deal with the, the issues that have been brought up in testimony this time and the time previous. Make sure that, you know, for instance, you know, we talk to the city commission and, and make a statement that, you know, the planning commission recognizes that this is not the best of all possible solutions, but it's the solution we have now. We need to continue to let them know that we need to continue to press on this. I mean, Bob Mahoney is right. I mean, you know, Bob, as you said many times, if you had the checkbook, you'd write the check and we'd be done. We know that. My so, wife has got it. I know she does. <laughs> That's why she's my friend. So let's... Let's get across that, you know, again, we've been kicking this can down the road for, you know, 30 years. It's past time we put our foot down and said, we're going to do this, but the rest of you, you know, and I'm willing to come to the Oregon Transportation Commission and basically make my comments to them that, you know, why aren't you doing something about this? And I'm sure they're hearing this from every single jurisdiction in the state and, and the 36 counties. They're all asking for money. Well. You want us to do all these planning things and you want us to be a regional center, but you're not giving us the support of the infrastructure that we really truly need and we truly deserve. That's my big concern. We can come back with a revised staff report for March 12th. Yeah, I would just say, let's question. just beef up the, bring us back the findings and uh, I would make a motion to that effect if I can get a second. My second just walked out the door, but I know where he is. <laughs> I'll second it. Oh, okay. My second just walked back in the door. <laughs> second. Okay. Can I just clarify, Denise, uh, the, we would add findings uh, for goal five. Um, were there any other sec uh, said, sections of the staff report where you would, I would say to see bring more? up some of, add in some of the information, not the information, but some of the concerns. So again, we've got the, you know, we want to make sure we call out <coughs> anything involving safety. You know, again, I'm, you know, you know about how I feel about Holly Lane. I'm just <coughs> skeptical as heck that we're going to be able to do anything with Holly Lane. And I advocated for taking it out of the TSP, which is why I did not support that. <coughs> I don't think we need, Holly Lane is just another big old mess of hornets that we don't, do we really want to deal with Holly Lane? Yep. I don't think so. Yep. Let's let the well, county deal with it. But I think you've got the safety stuff called out. I mean, when you were talking about yeah. the right lane run out, you specifically mentioned putting up the, the flashing pedestrian crossing right. and that sort of stuff. So I and think with what we've got, we've got the safety yeah, stuff. And the staff, you know, staff report can add a little paragraph about we received testimony regarding these things. They're addressed here, 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 and here. Yeah. That way, you know, I, I want the commi city commission to be assured that we crossed every T and dotted every I that we could possibly think of because they're going to be relying, they're not going to plow through all of this. They're going to rely on us for did we cover everything. And I just, again, I don't want this to be appealed. So I want to make sure we're tight on everything that we're doing. Okay, thank you. And I'll be looking for the comments in the comments. Oh, you can correct the comments. Which is for what? Okay, so we've had a motion and a second. Will you call the roll? Yes. The motion is for? Uh, to um, continue um, to March 12th, with basically come back with my, findings. I suggested we approve subject okay. to coming back yeah. for findings. Sorry, medication said go now. I left. Go. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm ready. Right. Go ahead. Uh, Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Guile? Aye. Chair McGriff? I'm usually last. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, Commissioner Mahoney? Aye. Commissioner Maybe? Aye. And Chair McGriff? 
I'm going to vote aye, and I just want to be very clear that we are not reopening the public hearing. We're just coming back for findings only, adoption. We're not going to go back, open this all up again. Correct? Yes. Correct. Kill? <laughs> Bill? Yes. We are not opening this back up. We're just coming back fine. for findings, and so I just wanted to be clear to the public, we're not going to do this all over again. We're going to review the findings and when we get our staff reports, and then we were going to, then we're going to adopt. It's going to be quick. Perfect. Okay. Aye. <laughs> Do we need to change the tape? Nope. He's shaking the Okay. Tape. Well, we're going to take a five-minute break. Oh, uh, now you're taking We are? <laughs> yes. <laughs> dying over here. Hope we just get I'm there. sorry. I was looking at you, and I was trying to get there. I know. I was exactly. Yeah. I know.
as we approach 10 o'clock, we have to close the meeting by 10 o'clock unless we have a unanimous decision from the commission to extend it to 11. So that's kind of what we're looking at. And I understand uh, Laura has some things about our next agenda item, which may change how that works too. Yeah, we're gonna ask for a continuance. I'll right. talk about it in okay. a little bit more detail. So the, let me give you these so I don't get them mixed up. That can be, this, that will be taken care of in yes. 10 yeah. minutes or less. Okay, so do you want me to open so we can speak about that? Let me get out of this other file here and get to the right file. I gotta get home watch the So just so you guys know, we do, we do read this stuff. We read everything. Maybe we read it too much, but that's our job. That's what we do. All right, so we're back in session and I'm going to go ahead and um, open item number 3B, site plan and design review and a variance for 24 unit multiple family development at 314 Pleasant Avenue. Planning files SP17119 and VR1711. Uh, I will go ahead and do the quick, I wish I could do the Cliff Notes version of this, but the quasi-judicial hearing process, and then I will turn this over to Stan. Can Stan. we do that even though it's continued? Okay. Yes. Okay, never mind. It's gonna be continued because we're gonna take the, we're gonna open it, so. Okay. So, as you know, I just read all those file numbers. Uh, we have a staff report that's been prepared for this application, has been made available to the public seven days prior to this public hearing. The staff report identifies approval criteria that applies to the applicant's proposals. Staff has analyzed that criteria, which is contained in the staff report. The quasi-judicial hearing procedure that the commission will follow is set out in state law and the Oregon City Municipal Code. Public hearing procedures are shown at the chart to my right. Anyone wishing to speak should fill out a speaker's card, which I have, and give it to the planning staff before the hearing or during the hearing. <laughs> speakers will proceed uh, in, not necessarily in the order of their card. Sometimes they get mixed up, so just bear with us there. You should put your address on the card in any way so we can contact you and we can notify you of the final decision. For the public record, please begin all testimony by stating your name. Testimony and evidence should be directed towards applicable approval criteria. If you believe other criteria apply in addition to those addressed in the staff report, identify and discuss that criteria and explain to us why you believe they apply to the application under consideration. A person may submit any written material while the public record is open on each application. Any written materials received by the city staff during the time period in which the public record is open will be placed in the record. Written materials submitted during the public hearing must be presented to the city staff in order to be part of that record. If a person intends to use PowerPoint presentations, oversized poster boards, reports, or other pictures or exhibits in their testimony to be placed in the record, copies must be submitted to the staff while the record is open. If they're not given to the staff, then we can't include it in the public record. Any person wishing a continuance to present additional evidence and testimony or to keep the record open to respond to new evidence must make that request before the public testimony portion of the hearing is closed. If the Planning Commission makes a decision in which you disagree, any issue you may wish to appeal must have been raised for consideration of the City Commission or the Land Use Board of Appeals or both without raising the issue on the record with sufficient specificity and accompanied by statements or evidence the City and all parties can respond to, the issue will not be deemed appealable to the State Land Use Board of Appeals. In addition, the failure of an applicant to raise constitutional or other issues related to the proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the local government or its designee to respond to the issue precludes an action for damages in circuit court. So we've, we're gonna open this file. Um, does any commissioner have ex parte contacts, conflicts of interest, bias, or any other statement to declare? Has everyone visited the site? I'll start with Vern. I, I visited the site. Um, no ex parte contact, no conflict of interest, no bias. <coughs> no, no, no. Okay, Bob? No, I have not visited the site and no contact or Conflict of interest. You drive up Malala Avenue, you <clears throat> drive by it. I try not to. You try not to drive up Malala Avenue. It's because of that congestion, mm -hmm. huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, no conflicts or bias, and I've driven by the site. I haven't, uh, one thing I haven't done is gone down Myrtle to look at it from that side. But. Yeah. 
Well, I have, um, I am extremely familiar with the site. I, um, matter of fact, one of our former planning staff lived adjacent to this site, so I went by it on a regular basis, picking her up and bringing her to work and dropping her off every day. I'm also familiar with the site. One of my family members is a member of the Soil and Water Conservation Board, and prior to the sale of the property to the applicant, uh, the applicant's represent the applicant's representatives, uh, I was asked to look at the site with regard to the tree canopy. Um, they, the Soil and Water Conservation District at the time had planned to build on the site themselves. Since that time, they, I have not had any contact with the Soil and Water Conservation District regarding this site, except for their new site on, that is going to be on Beaver Creek Road. So that is my ex parte with regard to that. I've obviously, as I said, been by the site many times, very familiar with it, uh, familiar with most of the trees on the site, I've walked the site. I know it quite well. Does anyone wish to ask questions of us about our uh, visits? Any contacts we've had with regard to this site? Hey, okay. Laura. All right. Thank Before you. Before you go, should I just basically say that we're probably not going to get to item three C? Because if anybody's here for that, I don't really want them to I'll sit be, through that. But we'll. Continue. I'm going to be five we'll minutes. Continue with um, so I can get crank through this, and I'll make sure I'll do it before. Two. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm your planner on this one. Uh, we have a lot of applications and not that many planners, so um, you get me today. This is an application for a 24-unit multifamily property located near Caulfield and Pleasant Avenue. You can see the site plan on the screen. As previously mentioned, at the end of this, we are requesting a continuance until March 26th um, to just allow us to get some uh, last-minute stuff worked out. Um, but we do have a full staff report. You may see that amended slightly the next time around. What that means is there's more opportunity for public comment, both in writing between now and a month from now on the 26th, as well as another um, opportunity to appear. We're not asking that the record be closed or anything like that. So here's the subject site. Um, as you can see um, on the screen, there is an arrow pointed to a heritage tree. Um, the site right now is primarily undeveloped. The heritage tree is a registered heritage tree or designated heritage tree as uh, Chair McGriff has identified. You can see uh, some set of the lands, the site plan on the screen right now. You'll see that there is a parking lot that's accessed off Myrtle Street. There is also um, a nature play area, retention of the tree, the historic tree and additional um, landscaping around the building. Do you have to point to that? You know, I can do it, Where's but it's gonna, you're not going to see it on your screens. I know, but we'll so, see it here. Okay. So here is, so, so Malala is right here, mm -hmm. Pleasant's right here, Caulfield there. Um, Myrtle is up top on this little street stub there. Um, there's a parking lot, and there's also parking on the adjacent <coughs> right-of-way as well. Where's the heritage tree? They yeah. want to know where the heritage tree is, Lori. The heritage tree's right there. Um, that's a good question. It's right here. Um, so we have a landscaping plan that shows you a bit more detail about the landscaping on site that's proposed. They have proposed above the minimum landscaping requirements, including retention of the designated heritage tree, which is a 39-inch caliper white oak tree. Um, it's a little deceiving on these charts because it shows up as the same size circle as everywhere else, but you can see that it's clearly much bigger. This shows the drip line and then the root zone as well. So the applicant is proposing to construct the building and do all the required pedestrian connections but retain that tree. It's because of that tree location that the building is pushed back from Pleasant Avenue. Here's some elevations of the structure. Um, you can see that there is a variety of architectural materials and doorways and entranceways and seatings and things like that. Um, there are these tall columnar trees that we'll talk about a, a bit later. It's kind of hard to see what the architectural materials are in black and white. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's big squares and horizontal I lines. See that. So. <laughs> I hope they bring a materials board. Oh, we have the electronic materials board that's in the record um, as well. So we don't require um, physical material boards. <laughs> Be nice if they brought it. Uh, okay. So there are three variances that are requested. They're all regarding the exterior of the building. So the top two are basically related to modulation articulation. I'm not going to go into any details because we're requesting continuance, but I did want to bring up what 
the variances that were requested and then go over some quick mitigation so you can chew on that um, over the next couple of weeks. So essentially our multifamily design standards require that buildings have modulation articulation. This building has some arti articulation modulation, but not enough to meet those two requirements. And so- I know I'm gonna interrupt you, but since you're talking about that and we've got people in the audience, why don't you use the pointer to show where that is? Um, so the building goes back and forth, so it's not a fl flat level. Um, you can see at each of these breaks, there, there's a change. Let me see if I have. And those protrude. Sorry, let me show they you. Per, they protrude, they ex, ex, extend out from the building. Mm -hmm. So if you I look mean, at this site plan, plan, yeah, so you see the site plan, okay. the building is bumps in and out. Okay. Um, so we have requirements on longer facades that you have those. And though this does bump in and out, it doesn't do it to the extent that's required by our code. So that's what the variance is for. Um, there's also a variance for a ground floor height of 13 feet. So in our code, there is a requirement to allow facilitation of changing to other retail use later, um, that the ground floor height be 13 feet. And in this particular application, when you're building a, a multifamily building, it doesn't make sense to make a 13 foot ground floor height because it will always be a multifamily. It's probably not likely to change to retail. So those are what the variances are. So you can think of those as a package. Really, it's looking at modulation, articulation, and that ground floor height. Um, G1 is a little bit more complicated because you have to pick three off the list, and they have two off the list, but they don't have the bottom two, which are the modulation part. They do have mitigation though. Um, so under our variance criteria, I'll show you in a second, uh, there is a list of that gives us guidance on knowing when to approve variances. Some of the mitigation they have proposed includes a large play area, so we don't require play areas. Um, this one has a couple different types of play structures as well. Uh, landscaping, all the landscaping in blue is not required. I think that's a really important thing because we do require parking lot landscaping, but we don't require landscaping between the building and the street or the building and the neighbor or anything like that. Our landscaping, we have a general percentage landscaping requirement, but our actual landscaping requirements are only really in 1752, which is dealing with parking lot landscaping in around that kind of thing. Um, and then the last thing is these large trees, um, columnar trees as well. So they're planted strategically in front of the building facade to break up the large mass of the structure as well. Um, and they're around the perimeter of the building. I didn't show you the parking lot elevation because those are required trees. So these are just ones that are not required. Uh, there's also a couple of pedestrian amenities. There is um, bench seating incorporated into the site, both on both sides of the elevation, on the front side of the building, which is facing Caulfield, not the parking lot side. There is a decorative arch with landscaping and seating, two seated benches. They're kind of hard to see, but they're right here on the side next to the person as well. Um, so in lieu, those are the- Wait, you yep. said there's an arch there? Right here. That's an arch. That, All right, I, I there. Think that's an arch. I think that's a square, a square pergola of some sort. I'm, when you say arch, I'm thinking of this. No, that's yeah. an arc. <laughs> no, that's an arch. <laughs> so that's like an egg. It is an egg. It looks like a pergola, pergola to me. So with, between the land, the so between the play area, the landscaping, the trees adjacent to the building, and the pedestrian amenities, uh, the staff recommends approval with conditions. For meeting the intent of the design standards. There is code that we look at to see if this should be approved or not. Here are all the chapters. I didn't list all the subsections because it can't all fit on a slide. Um, but with that, we request a continuance for March 26th so we can just uh, work on a couple of last minute details. That's all I have. Okay. All right, is one of the details the error in Recommendation six. You cut that already? What's well, recommendation six? Well, it doesn't matter. It's the nice bold error. Reference source not found. It's in the middle of your uh, Oh, and the conditions of approval, you mean? Yeah. You know, I fixed that four times. I don't know. Yeah, I, I saw it, but I wasn't going to bring it up. All right. I will address that as well. Yeah. So because I didn't print all of the 
I printed everything that I could. Some of the plans you can't print on your little home printer. So was I just want to make sure, was there a an existing tree plan? Because obviously I'm very aware that there are a lot of trees on that site. Yeah, there is an existing conditions plan as well as a tree removal and mitigation plan. So it went through the trees over six inches in diameter and identified if they were going to be removed or retained on that same chart. Okay. I, I wasn't able to print that. Mm. And then my other silly question is, you know, one of my favorite shrubs, so I'm assuming that those <laughs> long columnar trees they're, they're are cypress. not what I think it is. They're not arborvita. They're oh, cypress. thank God. I already asked her about that. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I hate them. I, I, I really like that. arborvitae. I know you do, and you're going to get me, and you're going to get me one as a going away gift when I leave the commission. I can have a rose on it. I can hardly wait. Yes, <laughs> so I don't like them because they're not native to here. Moving and why would we plant something here? That's well, if they weren't native, native from here, how come I keep buying them here? Because people bring them kidding, in. I'm important. kidding. Let's go on. <laughs> if you ask a silly question, I'll give you a silly answer. <laughs> All right, uh, so we're going to open the public hearing and take did public... We, did we extend? Did we ever... Not yet. Not yet until we hear the, the customer, I mean the customer, the co comments, right? We have no. several. No, 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 I mean the extend for the 10 o'clock oh. situation. Well, I'm assuming by the fact that you... Oh, I mentioned it, but yes. I didn't ever get a... Uh, you, did you ask for a vote? No. Okay, then... I would suggest you ask for one. And, it, and I think it needs to be a unanimous vote, right? Yes. To extend it to 11, well, we're going to 11 o'clock. Isn't that just a policy of the city? Well, it's it's not necessarily a time. We're going. I, my recommendation is that we go ahead and hear the public testimony. Yeah, we have the people here. Let's okay. hear them. here, and we will extend past. If we if we're all in concurrence, yeah. we'll extend past the time to hear the public testimony, and, call it and then we'll. Uh, okay. Then we will make a recommendation to continue, and we'll let the people here for 3C go home, which is why I was trying to get you to say what we're going to do so we can let them go home now. So can I clarify? Are you getting testimony for just this item or for yes. both items? No. Okay. Just for 3B. Do I have a consensus on that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So 3B, 3C people, we'll see you next time. Yeah. That's a lot average. Yes. It's the code amendment. It's which includes lot average. It's the code section that says Don't proposed leave. amendments to the development section of the Oregon City Code. That's our next. That's three C. So you pushed all these people out the door. No, I didn't. <laughs> all right, uh, applicants. Do you want to make a brief statement? Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Nikolai Urson. I work with Northwest Housing Alternatives. Um, I think we're here just to um, answer questions that might come up during public testimony and listen to the testimony, and hopefully we can resolve issues that people might bring up before the next time we come around. Um, I think that's about it. Okay. I'm Kevin Saxton. I'm the applicant. And um, I do have a presentation that I'll bring, I have with me now, but I'll, I'll present it next time. It has renderings so you can see the building in color and in 3D and um, help explain some of the features that we're proposing for our mitigation. Great. Okay. Don't forget to fill all the slips. Okay. Okay. Cindy, are you ready? Oh, wake me up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cindy and Rich, come on up. Us too. I am. <laughs> Sometimes these Hi, people, these I'm people. Cindy Sanders. I live on Myrtle Street. Um, this is my neighbor Scott. He's, Can I guess, going to speak back next there, if you call him. Yeah, yeah. she'll do it. Um, okay. I'm going to bring up the same issue we've been talking about um, too many cars dumping out into unsafe intersections, for one thing. I think that a 24 unit building on that spot with the um, traffic flow the way it is, where in Myrtle Street has no traffic right now because it's a dead end street. Um, it's gonna open Myrtle Street. Uh, so any um, cars traveling from that apartment complex will have to come down Myrtle Street and turn onto Pearl. Pearl I'm sure everyone yeah, knows about Thank Pearl you. Street, and it's a blind hill. Yeah, you look left, you cannot tell who's coming up that hill, and people notoriously are going 40 miles an hour by the time they get to the top of the hill because 
they gas it to get to the top. And it's a very, very dangerous intersection. Um, then they get on to the intersection of Pearl and Malala, another very dangerous intersection. I mean, this is, if people did studies, I think they'd find it's one of the most dangerous intersections in Oregon City. People run that red light all the time. I've lived there 25 years and I've seen it so much, it's unbelievable. They run it both directions on Malala. And um, I mean, I mean blatantly, while you're sitting there, I never pull out on a green until I look both ways twice. I got my car totaled sure. there already once. Um, so it, that happens a lot. There's also a no right turn sign before the intersection. It's kind of back here, so maybe if you weren't familiar, you could drive past it and not see it. But people ignore that sign or don't see it and turn right all the time, and that's also another kind of blind turn. Very dangerous. Um, that's my biggest concern, is I just think this city's got a lot of problems with congestion and traffic flow, and this is just going to create more. And, you know, then I have the whole thing of my neighborhood's going to change drastically, and, you know, I don't really like that. I would not be um, against, you know, a duplex or a triplex or something like that going in on that property, but 24 units, multifamily dwelling, that's a lot. That's a lot of people. I mean, you've got potential of twice that many people living there and, you know, 30 more cars traveling up and down our tiny little street that's always been very safe. Thank you, I think that's all I had to say. Scott, before you start, just a quick question. Laura, is there any, excuse me, Rich, is there any way that for the next meeting we can have the show this to this site plus Myrtle plus uh, where it Pearl. intersects into Pearl and the light because there is a light at Pearl and I was pointing to Commissioner Guile that it's in the blue part on the top. Maybe if we slid it down just a little bit somehow and got more of that in there. Yeah. Yeah. That would be really helpful because if people aren't familiar with that area, you know, the way I personally am, it's it's hard for people to imagine. And if you don't ever exit onto Myrtle Street to Pearl, you don't. You have no idea. Oh. No idea. Yeah, and so far we have three houses on our street, so it's not a big deal. We all know how to navigate that intersection, and so do our friends and family. But I'm telling you, when my grandkids were little and coming oh, over, I scary. didn't even let them get near that street. It's very scary. It's the first street they put a sign up when we get icy. I mean, you know. I know. I'm gonna have to drive there. Okay, yeah, you really should. Yeah, Rich, thank you so much. Okay, Scott Willey, 333 Myrtle Street. It's right there. Um, my concerns are the water runoff. There are several springs on that piece of property, and most of them end up in my basement. What are they gonna do with the, the downflow out off of the building and off of the, the parking and the traffic? And the trees, there's three trees on there that are just beautiful trees. Three of them are, or three of them are actually redwood and one of them's oak. And they've been stamped, the two big redwoods have been stamped. They had labels on them. I don't know whether heritage trees or what the deal was with that. But uh, they should not come down, they're beautiful trees. Uh, the oak tree, that's a beautiful tree too. Now the rest of it is whatever it is. There's a big fur on it on that piece of property too that's yeah, it's probably it's probably running its life out. It, it probably should come down because it's interfering with wires and everything else. But those other three trees should not come down. Uh, the impact of the people in the neighborhood it will be definite. There's, uh, it's actually a pretty quiet neighborhood at this point. It hasn't been in the past. One of my big concerns is uh, this will be for veterans, and most veterans have guns. Uh, guns. I, uh, I have a concern there. I, I would prefer it not to be a gun neighborhood, but that's my own concerns. I, uh, I got a problem with that. We already had one incident here a couple of years ago with uh, the SWAT team next door. I was in Eastern Oregon, so. Yeah, they were in my front yard. Yeah, that's wacko with guns. Uh, we don't need that. 
Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. This is the satellite dish place. This this is the uh, this is the old parking lot for Copeland Lumber. Oh, okay. Where the now community I know where development okay. department is, and then the then the old Copeland Lumber building, which is I'll, now community development, soil and water conservation, DHS is right there. Okay, I'll go look. Yeah. Okay, Rich and Larry. Which Rich? Uh, Rich Malloy. Oh, that's not Larry. Okay. Is that you? That's me. Okay. Sure. I don't have another Rich on here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Rich Malloy. I'm with the Housing Authority of Clackamas County. Um, we are a, a partner in this. So I'll disclose that with the Northwest Housing Alternatives. We'll develop the property, and we will um, then own and manage the property. And uh, I come here to speak in support of the variances, simply for the fact that the need, uh, one of the goals in your, in your plan I saw was the, uh, to increase the supply of affordable housing. Uh, in the recent homeless count, there was uh, 2,400 people in Clackamas County homeless. 128 of those individuals were veterans. Uh, we face a, a demanding waiting list every day. Uh, we have literally hundreds on that list, and when it opens, we literally get thousands of applications. So this is um, very important to serve a segment of the population that's underserved. And um, again, we feel it's a great opportunity to provide housing for those who need it in the community. Thank you. So how does that address the variance criteria, what you just uh, said? The to meet the, the variance criteria allows us to provide affordable housing, which is the goal, one of your goals, correct? It's only one, though. OK. <laughs> what? It's an important goal. It is. It's very important, but it's only one. OK. And you said you're the Housing authority is yeah, going to be owning I'm, I'm and operating. I'm the housing manager it. at the housing authority. You're the housing manager, so who's going to own and operate the facility? The housing authority. We are. Okay, that's what I thought you said. I just okay. wanted to clarify. Okay. The housing authority of Clackamas County. Correct. The same ones that own the ones on Holcomb Boulevard. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Nothing else. Go ahead. I'm Larry Mosley, and I am a resident of Oregon City, and many people know I'm an advocate for helping veterans. Uh, the problem is homelessness as it's been brought up. And there's only one, we only have a partial solution, and that is to, to provide homes. Now, there's two different sections that are work. One of them are the people that are living in the streets and doing the tents and stuff. The county's addressing that themselves with transitional housing, with these pods and things like that. These people are people, or families, who are like the rest of us, okay? The fact that they're veterans actually is a plus, because if you talk to any employers who's actually interviewed people, which I did for years, you know, if somebody is a veteran, it, it adds to it because you know they're going to be reasonable, they're going to be prompt, they're going to be all these other things. Um, they get pounded into them. Um, anyhow, so the county, I'm, I'm going real quick. Um, and again, to help alleviate this problem, you're going to have to be at time. I can't tell you what you have to be. I would suggest, I, I had a meeting this morning with Paul Savas about the veterans thing and also about transportation, but we won't go there. Um, and, I, and as I explained to him, <clears throat> in order for these things to happen, the you know, rents and things like that, there have to be accommodations made to the builders that are building these because they can't build the same building that you would build for regular people, that's probably not the right term, and make it cost effective enough, enough for, for people who have problems with rent because their rents got up so high. So what I'm getting at is the, the variance and so forth. Some of these things have to be considered and maybe at some point you may need to codify that. Um, and I'm not talking about safety issues or things like that. Um, anyhow, if this project can't be built, it means projects like it can't be built. And it means there's not going to be a, a solution to the homelessness. Um, in, that, in that case, there's two losers. There's 
the homeless person who, and families, because this is really set up for families, don't have a place to live. And the other situation is the city's going to lose because what will happen is they, the can will get kicked down the street and suddenly all these people will come up and they're going to start wanting to use public money for this. Somebody else is putting up the money, but they have to make it pencil if you've ever been in. So that's why I think this is very important. And it's, it's just the first, the first one. You're going to be more like this. Yeah, or you're, you're going to have more homeless. I mean, it's just because people can't pay the rents in the regular places because they keep going up. So you have to do something that can be built economically without, you know, doing, I, I, like I say, I'm not talking about safety issues and stuff like that. You want it to be safe and fire and all those other things. I guess that's all I got to say. I hope that met the criteria, Denise. Quick question for you. Yes, sir. Um, since you're oh, managing it um, and controlling the clientele is what is your current policy concerning personal weapons do you have is there i mean because i know it's public housing so is there a restriction or is there is it there's not second a, amendment wins the, the, the second amendment wins but i will say that everyone who is admitted to these uh, properties is properly screened um, many of these veterans come with uh, service case managers from the Veterans Administration. So they are taken care of, they are managed, uh, very closely managed in this uh, type of project for us is a win-win because we have those resources. Yeah. Just wanted to address yeah. the concerns that were yeah. brought up, so. Okay. Thank you. We have um, Stephen Morrison and Paul Edgar. Good evening. We need to change chairs. They were uncomfortable. The meetings would go faster if you had those chairs. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> my name is Stephen Morrison. I live in Colton, Oregon, and I did not come up 213. I went to uh, Milano to Canby up 99. I came around that way, so got that out of the way. I'm a service officer with uh, one of our local American Legion posts, but I'm not here to speak as uh, a service officer. My job as a service officer is to help veterans in need and direct them on to uh, uh, resources that they can access, whether they be with the Veterans Affairs or whether they be with the county or local community services. Um, and I'm also here to, to speak for my fellow veterans that are out on the streets tonight, the men and women that have served this country. They sign up, you know, they take the oath, you write the check, you know, to be cashed on, you know, he knows, uh, you probably know, I, I can smell them. Anyway, um, so anyway, um, I've been involved with as a veterans advocate uh, quite a few years, you know. Um, I'm retired military. I have 34 years of active and reserve in the military. Started off in the Marine Corps, uh, went from the Marine Corps to the Army to improve the Army, and I retired in 2004, but I also had a civilian job. Um, so uh, from, uh, I was a past participant on the uh, County Veterans Adv uh, Advisory Council, and I participated in the homeless count that the county and the public housing authority has to do every other uh, year for the last 10 years. And over the years, I've been able to see trends. You know, I'll, I'll go work at uh, uh, a food bank or I'll go up to uh, uh, the, uh, oh, the one site off of 82nd, I'm just slipped in my mind. I'm a little tired right now. But anyway, uh, and I see, you know, people coming back time after time, every other year. And some of them get better, some of them get worse, you know. And the needs uh, are great. There's no doubt about it. So that goes to number two, address critical facility needs. And three, you get the complaints about, well, these people are coming out of the woodwork. They're coming out of the bushes. They're doing this and that. That's number three. Enhance the livability of the entire community. Okay. You know that those aren't our criteria. I, that's the city commission's goals. Yeah, yeah but they're yeah, not I the criteria know, for approval like of the that. land use application. I understand. As that. much as we'd like them to be. Okay. Uh, so now his numbers are a little bit off than the ones that I looked up. You know, from the last uh, 2019. Uh, supposedly, you know, um, we have about 38,000 veterans in Clackamas County. Now these are just you know all that are you know that the state knows. But out of that, uh, when we do the count. Uh, you know, we actually, HUD requires us to actually see, touch, 
and talk to, you know, the veteran, you know, and he has to answer certain questions. And uh, my numbers are a little lower than his, and, and I don't know, you know, I think it's from my notes from before. So I, I found 85 veterans, uh, okay? Uh, 52 of the 85 were unsheltered. 30 were homeless, chronically homeless, and they multiple times over, you know, multiple periods of times or over a year and so forth like that. 10 of the 85 in my study were families with kids. Now these, you know, some of them are actually living in cars and vans and buses, you know, and things like that, and in uh, garages. You know, that's actually true. Uh, 10%. Mr. Morrison, do you know that your time is just about I'm up? sorry. That's okay. okay. I'm, 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 you know. I know, um, you're new to this. We're all new. Yeah, just all new to this. So anyway, uh, as far as the, uh, uh, the end there, uh, one of the major obstacles is developing affordable housing is the cost. And when you add in some of these things that have been asked, you know, it's going to cause uh, the cost to go up and then it becomes unaffordable. And it'll also delay the whole project if they have to push it off. And my final statement is this. Our nation has been in an armed conflict for the past 16 years, and we still have not met the needs of our veterans from previous wars and conflicts. In the military, we have what we call battle buddy. That is an individual that has your back, protecting you when you sleep, eat or pray. Yet when these service members leave and go home to Oregon, sometimes they lose that support system. They can fall to the side, forgotten. And I ask the Oregon City Planning Commission to step up and be the battle buddy for these general, these uh, service members. Um, it, it's, you know, like I say, you know, I've been an Army brat, you know, my dad and so forth like that, and I've seen the system change. I remember coming back, landing in L.A. from, you know, overseas and having strange looks back in the 70s. Uh, you know, so I kind of get a little upset when I hear certain things, you know, uh, about veterans. You know, there's, it's, they're not Rambos. They're not going to go wild. I think that was brought up earlier. Okay, I'm... All right, I'm done. Yeah. I have a quick question for him. Though. Sure. Because I'm not, I'm not really familiar with it. Is there a higher percentage of veterans that are homeless than the average citizens that are homeless? <laughs> That's true. Yes. It is. It is very high. Keeps, who tracks those statistics? Is well, that the government? HUD, HUD, uh, HUD requires uh, uh, that all public housing authorities do a biannual uh, count on the odd years, 2017, 19, something like that. We're getting ready for that. And they make these rules so hard. So when we find, you know, 85 or 125 veterans in the whole county, well, we're not being able to get out in every every little, you know, cubby hole down Newell Creek, you know, or whatever, you know. And it's hard, and we do it with volunteers uh, and uh, staff from the county and so forth like that, and they crunch these numbers, and they have all these rules from HUD and okay. the state and all this other, and, and it's difficult. And the, and the reasons why they are at a higher level is because uh, they have different kind of issues. Okay. When they lose that uh, buddy system, you know, when they lose that connection to the family of the military, you know, whether it be in the, the ship, you know, your shipmates, you know, you hear those terms, you know, right. are, you know. I understand all yeah. that. I'm better so, going to Paul since I've taken up too much of your time. Yeah, but, um, yeah, they do have different issues, and uh, to solve any of the issues, you know, the first thing you got to do is have, you know, uh, housing under you. If you've got a roof over your head, you ain't going to be worrying about, you know, Okay. Uh, going to the job interview tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. All right. Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul Edgar, Oregon City. I've been involved in new homeless and affordable housing issues for, I've really put a lot into it for a lot the last three years. And I sit on the board of a homeless outreach or veteran outreach center where we actually try to keep roofs over the heads of people because the market costs are squeezing them out. I'm also on the Veterans Advisory Council for the county. I think this is a good thing, but one of the things that I was issued that's important to me is that we, that you guys and the, and the Planning Commission and everyone really looks into their heart about making some, any type of demand through code Let's say as an example, they've come up with a good system that allows them to handle stormwater better. And they are not going to push any stormwater out into the streets. That's what I, I think the issues are, things like this that we could be doing. So if we start trying to create 
onerous uh, code things that make the cost go up. That maybe, you know, we could charge it. It's like uh, some SDC fees for transportation when we know that a lot of these people uh, really can't afford cars and are not making a lot of the trips that a lot of other people would have. We have to be trying to look at how we could keep uh, this formula here. Their, the plan here is that they're going to charge people what they, a, a portion of what they make. So some person could be in there uh, at far lesser money because they, they really only have a, 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 a veteran housing allowance or something like that that's, that they're dealing with or they're on Social Security or some type of support means. So this is really humanitarian, and we want to make sure that they can meet those goals of what they're doing. And anything that we can, we can look at that can help them uh, mitigate or keep their costs down or waive something in order to make sure that this project goes through uh, and it's affordable and meets the numbers that are necessary, this is all positive. I sit there, we give up money to keep roofs over the heads of people, but Clackamas Community College, right up the road, doesn't have any student housing for veterans. It's an award-winning program for veteran education. This, this would be an amazing place, even if I just looked at it for that purpose. And that would be absolutely winning. Thank you. Okay. Laura, can I ask a couple of questions for you, Bill? Just does, keep it to I know. the criteria. Does HUD own this property right here? This, this that we're no, looking at? No, they purchased it from the Soil and Water Conservation. The only reason I'm asking is, um, if, if the HUD did own it, that means it's owned by the federal government or the county? Is that, would that be true if by HUD? HUD is a federal agency. Right, yes. federal agency. The only reason I'm asking, can you limit the kind of people that come in there? Can you say only, we can allow only veterans or we can only allow this, or do you have to be open? Um, I don't believe, I th I'm sorry. There, there's a lot of assumptions built in that it's hard to kind of unpack. Yeah. The, the general answer is no. That they couldn't limit it just to veterans. Yeah. Yes. But we do have a reason. If, if I may, I can add some context. Name. One more time. Nick Ierson from Northwest Housing Alternatives. So um, this project has been fully funded by uh, all of our funding partners, uh, one of them being the state of Oregon. Uh, as part of a, uh, as part of that grant, they they are putting a restriction on who we can rent the the uh, units to to veterans, and and they have a definition of what a veteran is, and we have to follow that strictly. I see. Okay. And that affordability restriction lasts for 60 years. So for 60 years, the project <coughs> will provide homes for tw for 24 households that are headed by veterans. I just didn't know it. That popped into my head like, hmm. yeah. Thank you. So the funding sources will do it. Okay. So we're we're not going to. Um, close the record on this particular application and so if you come back for the next meeting and you want to testify again you can um, I'm going to just articulate one more time that we are not I'm not speaking for all well I'm speaking for all of us we're not unsympathetic to what you're saying but we can't approve a project because we like it that's not how it works it has to meet the criteria and standards, and the city set these standards for a specific reason because there was a community desire about how they, the city of Oregon City and the residents wanted our community to look. So I'm not saying anything about the, the specifics of the case, but I'm just saying that that's why we have standards and criteria. So we, we're looking for information from the public regarding the standards and criteria. If we were to just approve things that we didn't like or did like, there'd be a lot more denials, I think, on this commission. But that's not how it works. We can't approve something because we like it. So I just want to be clear that we appreciate your testimony and we appreciate your passion. I've known that this has been an issue with Paul for a very long time. But we have to look at the standards. That's why we're here. If they met all the standards, we wouldn't even be seeing this. It'd be going through a type two and it'd be done. <laughs>
Yeah, and I just wanted to pop in um, for one quick question, which is um, similar to the last one, we identified some issues so we can come yes. back with more findings. Are there any particular issues, um, knowing that you guys read the staff report and all that, that we need to pay particular attention to? Um, I know it's a part of the final plan, but I'd like to see what 20 feet of Myrtle looks like. You know, is, is, and I know it would be a rough diagram, but there's no sidewalks currently on Myrtle. So I, does that mean that we're going to end up with street up against somebody's driveway, you know, doorway? Or does that mean, you know, that it's already 18 feet of pavement, so we're not going to take testimony, sir. So, so you want a general cross-section of what it looks yeah. like? Right. Yeah. Or what it will look like. Yeah, because I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to have you know the street go right across somebody's you know garage door yeah. or whatever. And I guess I also I'm, I'm I, I made copious notes on this. And I'm not going to go into all of them tonight because of the of the hour. But my one of my questions is to staff is, uh, as I said, I'm very familiar with the street. Was Myrtle the only alternative to be used? I mean, I when I saw that it was going to access on Myrtle, I the planner in me said, really? Yeah. Um, knowing what the street is like and again you know putting more traffic on it than it currently has any capacity in, in the world to handle um, like I said I wasn't able to print out the you know I'm a big tree person I like to see a lot of trees retained it doesn't matter in a lot of ways for me personally that you're going to cut down all the trees and then you're going to replant them we have the same problem with subdivisions they come in they clear cut everything and they say, oh, look at all the nice trees we're going to plant. To me, that doesn't mitigate the big trees. And there are a lot of trees, as was already testified. So I want, I'm going to try to get a copy of the existing plan from the staff so I can look at it, not from the visual on site, but look at it is what they're proposing. Um, it's just a matter of semantics. I really will tell you honestly in this in the applicant submittal, I really wasn't sure what they were applying for. It wasn't real clear. I mean, I know that it's an application for a variance, but I had to hunt to find it to say, okay, we're applying for this because, or we're doing this because I couldn't find a lot of that. Um, I guess I'm looking forward to seeing the real deal for the black and white. Um, it's hard for me to understand what the articulation is of the building when it's a flat sort of computer generated thing. Um, I'd like to see also how the, the building relates to the surrounding neighborhood. Are the, is the building bringing in any elements that sort of reflect the existing housing in the neighborhood so it doesn't just completely stand out and be so different that it doesn't look like it fits in? How does it fit into the neighborhood? You know, it's an older established neighborhood. There's a lot of really old houses there, um, not super old like my neighborhood, but it's an older neighborhood. And I can't really tell from that what, we, what was submitted, how it relates to the rest of the, and I know one of the standards is looking at how it affects the surrounding neighborhood, and I can't really see that from what I got in the, in the packet. So that's something that I was interested in seeing. Um, and kind of piggybacking one of Denise's, I guess, because of the Myrtle issue, and this might be for more of the applicant when he comes back, is was there consideration to basically flip the parking lot in the building so that entrance is off Pleasant to a parking lot, the building, you know, Myrtle stays the way it is, um, and that I would almost think would help retain some of the older trees too. Um, but, you know, is, was did we force them to put the building up against Pleasant, or was it just a okay? So, is it required? We are maximum setbacks or requirements. The buildings be close to the street. You saw that it wasn't close to um, Pleasant because of the retention of the heritage tree mm -hmm. and some of those other trees there. Yeah, we we can make some accommodation for that because we don't. The last two heritage trees we designated got acts of God on them, and so they're no longer there, which is yeah. like really. And I guess the other thing, too, is that any sort of a, a plan by the landscape architect about how that tree is going to be protected, and I don't mean with just a little wimpy fence around it, how is it going to be protected during construction? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's big. 
I'm sure there's more, but that will happen next time. With that, I move for a continuance to March 26th of uh, planning oh, file, whatever. Second. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that uh, I wanted a second. we continue the public hearing with the record remaining open. Yep. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody next time. Uh, if we have any other concerns, I'm sure that as planning commissioners, we'll get that information to staff so they can relay that to the applicant. Or if we have any other questions. Okay. Commissioner Mabey? Aye. Commissioner Mahoney? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Guile? We're voting on the mobility. They continue on. Alternative mobi mobility? No. Yeah. Continue. Aye. Aye. I know, I'm Aye. kidding. Chair McGrath. Aye. All right, you have some communications for us. I'm aware of some communication. I don't have any communication. No. I just got a notice of land use action in my house today about something that's going to come before us. Do we need to continue? I have a quick third? question, though. Public hearing yeah. is closed on that. Quick question for you. Uh, I'm sorry, um, Ms. Reed just reminded me, can we open and continue the third item yes. to a date certain? So um, I'm going to open the public hearing on file L, I was getting there, L1704, proposed amendments to the development section of the Oregon City Municipal Code. Can I have a motion to continue? So what date do we want to do it for? You can do March 12th, which is the okay, next available right. date. Yeah. Okay. So I move we continue L1704 to March 12th. Is there a second? I'll second. <gasps> Tom seconded the motion. <laughs> okay. What a shaker. I second I that in motion. Aye. Okay. Commissioner so Johnson. Second. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Aye. Your need to continue. Oh, continue. Aye. Continue. Aye. Commissioner. Aye. 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 Okay. Consensus. <laughs> We're still in session, Paul. 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 We're still in session. Thanks. I do have a question for you. All right. Um, has the city made any comments about the article that just came out in the Oregon City News by Raymond Rendleman about the legacy project? Have they made any comments or? Anything. No, the city has not put out a statement about the news article you that just came out. Paper? Wednesday. The, the, the the last week's or this week's? That's coming out this week. I've okay, I haven't that. seen this week's yet because this week has. <laughs> it, was on, it was online and somebody I know, put it out. I don't, I don't read the paper online. It's too hard. It's only online. It's not out on the paper. The paper hasn't come out yet. Oh, okay. I usually see the Somebody asked me on what? Tuesdays when I see it sometimes, but I don't read it online. Too tiny. It was kind of interesting. Anything that you want to give us a heads up that's coming down the pike? Um, well, you guys know you're going to be busy. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's that's a given. I like it when we're busy because that means the city's busy. <laughs> Breaks the are city good ain't too. busy, then nobody's busy. Yeah. Um, no, but we just to remind everyone we do have a hearing scheduled for March 26th, which is spring break. Um, and we have three items me. scheduled for that. Doesn't affect me. So yeah, I'm good. Um, if I'm if anyone's going to be gone, please let me know. Yeah. I don't think the spring break affects. Maybe Zach would be the only one, or Paul. But the rest of us, I'm we're, spring, I'm, we're spring break averse. I'm already. Broken. We wish we had a spring break. <clears throat> Thank you for the heads up on that, Paul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, we always have that little bit of that issue when Can I ask last about week. April 9th? Is there only one issue on the docket at that time or on the agenda? Under or is there going to be more? You're not coughing. Mm -hmm. oh, I think there will be more. Probably feel better too that you're not Is that going to be yeah, first so people don't oh, the walk out and leave? And what did he say? Yeah, right they're now it's the only thing on the agenda. It depends. Well, should there be more? Well, there's three things before at the hearing before, so if any of those get continued. So I don't know. Okay. I assume that I've heard more. from a lot of people that, that that was put off so long last time somebody was out there with kids, they said they left because they just couldn't wait any longer. Well, I mean, the planning commission Bring can move the agenda you. item around. Okay. I mean, you have that authority. All right, thanks. So, Kelly, you got two weeks to go. Woohoo! <laughs> You're grateful. She says, I'm done with this. I don't know any woman that's ever been pregnant that said, oh, I want to be pregnant till the very end. <laughs> <laughs> they do before they're pregnant. <laughs> yeah, but they don't know what they're getting into right. when that ha when that statement is made. All right, yeah, being no further business, we are adjourned. Gentlemen, thank you as always for the pleasure.